We're live. All right, so we are ready to call the order, Mayor. Great, uh, so we have a quorum. Uh, may we have the roll call, please? Yes, uh, Councilmember Blatt just noted that he's having technical issues, so- He's, we'll he's on now. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Councilmember Blatt? Here. Councilmember Haney? Here. Councilmember Francina? Here. Councilmember Wyrick? Here. Mayor Sticks? Here. All percent. Great. Um, and may we have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Move to approve. Although we won't know what it is. <laughs> it would be the agenda that was previously released that the council hold a city council vision and goal setting workshop. Yes, I, I move to approve that, all kidding aside. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, approved. Excellent. So moving uh, on to public comment. Do we have any public comment, James? Uh, we have two public comments currently we will be we will let uh the first person in the room now thank you hi Stuart. i've enabled your ability to unmute yourself Stuart, you are on okay yeah thanks um well, i'm just gonna hang out and kind of follow along for now i don't have anything specific to add but you know been following along uh, on the website and uh figured i'd uh I'd want to, you know, see if I have any any place to give some input, but nothing specifically right now. Thanks for having me, though. Well, okay. th thank, thank you. you. We'll we'll leave you in the waiting room. And thanks for coming, Stuart. Appreciate hey, it. Hey, my pleasure. Um, who's next, James? Okay, so that's the only one, so we can actually move on. Okay, well, let's move on to our wonderful, exciting workshop, and. Um, Thank you so much, Jim, for being here. Well, I don't see you on my, um, you want to take it away? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, as I indicated to you on Tuesday, uh, I do facilitation and meetings, but my primary role has been generally working with organizations and leadership teams uh, to confront uh, a reality that's in the world today, which is the speed and rapidity of change. And one of the foundational uh, uh, part of part of my work is built on a fairly rigorous, or not fairly, but a very rigorous body of knowledge uh, that uh, speaks to transformation, and is grounded in the, in the area of language. Uh, it's supported with some philosophy and science, but that's not what we're here for. But I wanted to open this up with just a few remarks about maybe how to listen and how to orient ourselves to what we're doing here today. Uh, as I understand it, and what you've declared is that you want to create a vision and specific goals for the city. And that's the purpose for the conversation. Uh, it is, in my view, to be a conversation. Uh, this is not set up and I'm not working to facilitate a debate or argumentation. I'm, I, in my view, and the primary foundation of my work in leadership is to appreciate that leadership is a creative process. It's a creative endeavor that, you, that uh, and I'll show you a slide in a moment, but that human beings are continuously creating our future and that we live in a kind of ocean of language and that we are continuously generating uh, whatever our future and our reality is. And we do that specifically in conversations. So when I say this is a conversation, I'm hopeful that it'll be a conversation that will begin to open up something new that would not have occurred otherwise, or that it'll be something that'll clarify something that perhaps has not been clear, and that it'll allow you as a council to begin to individually and collectively focus on what is the future that you are uh, committed to creating uh, for the community and for yourselves as well. Uh, it's also something that Bill mentioned on Tuesday, which is that this is an awkward to have a conversation on, on a camera. You know, that when we're, when, we're, when we're normally having a spontaneous dialogue, uh, we don't uh, need to think about whether we're being uh, observed or not. And so whether this was in a corporate corporation context or whether it's in a public forum such as we're in today, or any other form, it's always awkward when there are observers 
watching you have a dialogue. And yet I'm going to encourage you to the extent possible to approach this as a uh, not just another meeting, uh, but an opportunity to listen deeply to each other, to engage the questions that I, I'm going to throw at you, uh, and to basically allow something to appear that perhaps would not appear normally in the normal course of the way you work. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to be asking anybody to uh, commit to anything. Uh, by the same token, I am I shared with you on Tuesday that in my work and my view, commitment is the key to creating anything. Uh, that when people agree, that doesn't make anything happen. When people commit to what they agreed to, something can happen. We've all seen conversations that uh, sort of sound like spectators talking about a game. And then we've also observed conversations that actually make something happen. Conversations about change or conversations that actually change something. Uh, I'm hopeful that this will be a conversation that actually changes something. Uh, the uh, other thing I shared with you on Tuesday is that at the end of the day, uh, commitment in my work, in my view, is only something that's relevant to the individual. Uh, so that while this, the council may have a process of reaching some alignment and commitment as a council, that's actually a function of your individual commitments. So when we're all done, uh, I hope that you will be committed to what you've created, or if not, that you'll let any dissent or disagreement stimulate and provoke further conversations. Uh, finally, or not finally, but next, I would also like to say that in, in my thinking about this, I don't expect that you'll have to vote on anything today. Uh, I don't see that this is a, a voting type meeting. I think what you're going to require is some time after this meeting for the staff, and I'll be happy to support it, to do some wordsmithing, to tighten the language that you might want to have and uh, offer to the community in terms of what the vision of the community might be. Uh, that's likely not that that's not going to happen probably in this meeting. Uh, likewise, you're going to identify a number of goals uh, and whether you I don't know that you need to commit to those goals today so much as to get clear what is the handful of goals that you do want to commit to. And I suggest and recommend that you do that at some future meeting uh, and, and do it in a, in a formal voting. Today is principally a creative dialogue. It's to create something. It's not to analyze or debate. Um, and if you have disagreements, there's lots of room to do that. But let's let our disagreements contribute to the creative process rather than become argumentative or a debate. Um, now, there's a few core ideas that I wanted to just put on the table uh, that I work with and that I'm going to ask you to uh, to use or to at least have in, in your background uh, to inform and hopefully empower the conversations that we're going to we're going to have. Uh, the first and probably the most important is the foundational idea. And this is philosophical. Uh, and let's put up slide number 20. Uh, that reality is an interpretation. Uh, let's, James, you had it done the other way before. We, yeah, that's right. So this is a this is a, a, a statement I'm making, uh, and, and I'm going to tease it out a little bit. But it's it's important because we most of us have grown up in a culture and in a time where our notion, our, our sort of taken for granted notion is that reality is a consisting of objective facts, that reality is a collection and combination of things, and that really the job of living is to understand and to then apply some kind of knowledge uh, to try to produce uh, the changes in reality that we want. Now, there's two perspectives that we can take on interpretation. So the next one, uh, James. If we look at reality as an interpretation, another way of thinking that is a social construct. 
I'm suggesting to you that there's two ways to think about how that construct uh, can be uh, occurs. One I'll say is past determined uh, based on your common sense and let's call it your conventional wisdom. Another way of looking at the construct is that the construct is something that's actually future determined, that's created continuously by commitment, imagination, and vision. Now, this is a this is a mindset shift. Uh, George Bernard Shaw once said, "Reasonable people adapt themselves to the circumstances. Unreasonable people adapt the circumstances to themselves." Progress depends upon unreasonable people. Now, most of us have grown up thinking about reasonable as a virtue. And that really one of the things we really have to do is be reasonable about things. But if you only commit to what's reasonable, by definition, you're going to be creating to something that's already determined by the past. You're going to be taking your history, projecting it in front of you, and then making allocating resources and decisions and commitments based upon your prediction. But that's a form that's not moving into a future that's actually projecting the past onto the future. And that's what produces more of the same. Uh, that's what produces what's that French proverb about the more things change, the more they say the same. And again, this is a habit of how human beings have 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 evolved socially and historically and philosophically to where we have a, a mindset that believes that reality is consisting of facts. No, I'm saying reality, I'm not saying there's not a reality, but I'm saying whatever reality is, is not fixed, not objective, not factual. The reality of someone in the Middle East is a different reality than yours and my reality. It's not that we simply have two views of the same reality. We have two different realities. Now, all of this is just to make the point that the work you're doing today and the work you're always doing really is you're generating reality. You're generating the future in all of the different kinds of conversations that you have. Now, let's look at the next slide. If you look at a history, if you look at reality as a historical uh, produced phenomenon, uh, what you see is that we live with this notion that. Uh, our thinking and so forth is a function of internal processes, mental models and feelings, and that we, we take that fixed reality that a human beings are like objects, and we then limit, and this is how it relates to today, we limit our choices and our actions based on what we think about the circumstances and situations. So that anything that we think is beyond our control is something that we can't deal with. We just have to cope or accept or react to it. So this again, I'm suggesting to you today, as you're speaking, there's going to be a lot of, I suspect, thinking automatically and just the way we approach a conversation that we cannot do certain things because of some limitation that we believe. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the belief. I'm just simply saying it is a belief. It's not the truth. So if you believe that there's a limitation on what you can and cannot do, that's legitimate. That it's the truth is not, not valid in the way I'm uh, constructing this, 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 uh, this conversation. Now, if we flip over to the other side, this is what I'm going to encourage today. Next slide. In a commitment-driven uh, interpretation of reality, then, then we're concerned about how does the world occur? Now, normally our behavior and our actions are a function of how things occur for us. So if something appears to be a threat, typically you'll do whatever you do when you feel threatened. It doesn't mean there's a, a threat there like a fact, but if something occurs like a, like a threat, you'll respond to it as if it's a threat. Does that make sense? So this is this idea of, of you your actions, and that's where that's what we're really trying to focus on here. That yours and my actions are a con are, are a correlate of how our reality occurs for us. 
and we're going to talk about possibility in a minute because it occurs as ability, it will pull for different action than if the future occurs as a challenge, for example. If the future occurs as impossible, then it will it will never pull for the kinds of action that might make it make it so. So when you're creating reality, it's important to understand that whatever's occurring to you as a as a constraint or whatever's occurring to you as a threat from one point of view can be an excuse and a justification not to commit or on the other from another from this side point of view it's a it's an item of action it's actionable it's something that we have to work on something to do something about uh, when i was in argentina uh, i discovered something interesting about about how different cultures work. Uh, they were talking about all the difficulties in government and particularly corruption. And, and I was making a proposal. I said, well, we could do this or we could do that about this, this problem. And they said, well, that's very difficult. And it took me a while to appreciate that when, a, when in, in that culture, someone says it's very difficult, what they're really saying is it's impossible. And if something is uh, impossible from your point of view, you don't bother to, to, to think about it. You don't bother to work on it. You just have to settle for it. So again, my encouragement here is to have this conversation be a committed conversation. Now, the final thing I want to say before we actually dive in and do, and do some work here is I want to talk about uh, language in particular terminology. Uh, we all use language, but we don't necessarily all mean the same thing when we use language. So, for example, I'm going to be suggesting that the first conversation we're going to have, and probably what will take, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, is to have what I would call a conversation for possibility. It's not a conversation about possibility. It's a conversation to generate possibility. Now, possibility is one of those words that lots of people have different uh, ideas about. So I'm gonna suggest one here. I say that possibilities do not by definition exist in reality. The word possibility evokes not real. If you could prove a possibility, it would be an example. Let me say it again. If you if you if somebody says something is possible, and you could look around and five, you know, get evidence that it is, then you've objectified the idea of possibility, and it's now an example. It's not a question of whether it's possible. It's just another option. On the other hand, if you say something is possible, and there is no example for it, then you have essentially a pure possibility. The possibility of man flying, you know, the possibility of breakthroughs, the possibility of the human genome, you know, the possibility of uh, 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 a breakthrough in some in some endeavor. Is it possible you could run a marathon? You know, sure, it's possible. Are you committed to it? That's another question. But then if you argue against it, I can't run a marathon, and you start to argue why I can't run a marathon, you're actually arguing about whether it is or isn't possible. So the normal way we talk about and work with possibility is we look at whether something's possible, and then we argue whether we believe it or don't believe it. There's another way of doing this, which is you actually take the case that something is possible. So this is the this is the primary place I want us to begin. Take the case that something is possible and then stand in that possibility. Put it on like a suit of clothes. Immerse yourself inside whatever the possibility is and look around and see what you can observe from that point of view. Now I want to make I want to slow down here and get any questions you may have because this is the this is the key move between having a conversation about vision and beginning to actually create a vision. Now, a vision in my nomenclature 
and, I, and this is the, the hard definition, the vision is not a goal. The vision is the future as a possibility. And we've all been in different meetings and different uh, uh, conversations and vision planning meetings and things like that. And usually when the vision gets done, people are pretty inspired. They're pretty turned on. Tell me if this is your experience. They, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, a good feeling, an inspiring moment when people create vision. They typically then end up writing down some lofty words. You know, we're going to be the best there ever was. And then we put it in a drawer someplace or we make it a slogan on the wall. And very quickly it begins to disappear. Is that your experience? Nod your heads if, if it is. Nod your heads this way if it isn't. So, so why is that? Primarily because people think that the vision is a statement about the future. The vision is a statement about the future as a possibility in present time. That's why the most powerful visions, the visions that transform a culture or transform a company or transform an individual are those kind of visions where you wake up into the vision, you live the vision, you bring the vision with you to whatever you're doing. It's a continuously and constant part of your background interpretation. Your life, it becomes about expressing and manifesting the vision. Another way of thinking about this I use uh, is a coaching example. If, if, you, if, you, if you're going into a game, you have to be committed to the possibility that the game is already won. It's a difference, but this is a difference between trying to, to well, we'll get into that later. The, my, my main idea here though, is I'm going to ask you to have a conversation for possibility. And then that will produce whatever it produces. And, that, and whatever that produces will then become the, the raw material for, for articulating and wordsmithing a, a vision for the community. Now, before we get into doing any of that, I want to go around and let each of you speak a little bit. If you have any questions about anything I've said is this preamble, but also I'd like you to say anything you have to say or would like to say uh, about your thoughts about the future, your thoughts about vision, your thoughts about something that you're committed to creating or what you'd like to get out of this conversation. So let's just try to, to go around and, and let you express sort of where you're at coming into this, and then we'll move forward. <clears throat> and everybody can keep their mics open if you want, as long as there's no noise in the background. Do you, are you looking for a volunteer? To go first, or are you going to go? Well, well, I'll call on people if you want, but I'd prefer just to keep this open and free form and jump in when you're ready to say something. If you're, go ahead, Susan. Oh, I don't mind going first, but if someone else wants to go first. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Fine. Go ahead. Um, well, I actually did write down my vision for the year 2045, <laughs> and I'll, I'll be 96 years old then, so I may live to see it. Um, it's about three or four minutes. Shall I? Shall no, I no, don't, 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 don't read the whole vision right now, but continue, okay. continue to talk about, so you, why, why did you pick 2045? Because that's the, uh, the year, uh, of our, for our general plan. But I mean, I, it could happen sooner. Well, give me, give me just one highlight, just one highlight from oh. it. Uh, that, well, it's the year 2045 and Ojai has evolved to become a model sustainable city that artists, architects, city planners, scientists, farmers, educators, policy, policy makers and visitors from all over the world come to come to observe, study and experience. Great. So that that's a great oh. state. Is that a great statement? Am I done? <laughs> no, 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 but I, I, I want everybody to say that's a great statement. 
-hmm. but it's just a statement. Yes, and then I get into. Is it wait? wait just, just stay with me for a minute, because I'm provoking. Yeah. I'm you because you went first. And I'm going to provoke. Uh, uh, hopefully, it provokes something here. Okay. So, is that going to happen? Well, to, in my mind, I've lived with this for decades. Yeah. So and, so far, so know, far, it hasn't happened. Uh, well, I can see signs that it's moving in that direction extremely slowly, and so when I see. Uh, little signs of that. Uh, I feel my job is to advocate and support those signs. Yeah, and it's a hopeful. It's a hopeful way of relating to that. I'm not. A, I'm not challenging you or criticizing you here, but I want you to see that this is a this is a kind of articulated statement of the future. That yeah. for most people, does not occur like a real possibility. Yes, but I thought we were. Uh, to me, I, it's, I'm open to that possibility and completely open and committed to that possibility. I, and I'm totally <laughs> aligned and happy for that. Uh, the, my, my question though, Susan, and again, I'm not, I'm not wanting to argue. I want you to see that maybe there's something else that's missing that would need to happen in the world around you in order for that to happen. Yes, I, I believe that there is something missing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Now, <laughs> I'm saying in order to begin to see what's missing, uh -huh. you'd have to to operate as if that vision had already occurred. All right. Yes. Be why? Because that would make you a different observer. And let's, let me say it another way. A coach does not go into a game to find out if it's going to win. Uh-huh. He has to go in committed that it's he's already or she's already won. Because yeah. that's the only way you can observe what's missing in the present. Okay. Now, so hold the statement. I'm not criticizing the statement. Hold the statement and let's see where everybody else is and then see how that begins to to occur in this conversation. Yeah. I I I want to add I wrote that statement after listening to some of your videos and um, reading uh, segments of your book, because it's my nature that because I'm committing to this time with you, I wanted to know more how you operate and who you are. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much. And you know, and again, I'm saying there's nothing wrong. Or in, perfectly, it's an inspiring statement you just made. But but if you, if there isn't a cons a commitment to that, and a mobilization of the community around that. It's just yep. a, it's just a statement. I understand. I understand. Yeah. 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 OK, so Thank let's you. I've got more on to this later. Somebody else. Randy, you want to jump in? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's interesting. I um, as I'm listening to this, um, it seems like um, like Susan's statement was a broad vision of community, a forward thinking broad. You know, that's the big goal. And, and so um, I think that that's one form of, of a vision. I think another form of a vision, um, and you said it's, and you and you were saying, well, goals aren't visions. And I agree with that. Goals are goals. To me, visions are the actions that one takes to achieve the goals. So the vision that we would set forth for sustainability in Ojai, so the, so the, the goal would be sustainable Ojai, the vision, is how we achieve that and how we set forth in our future thinking to achieve that. So um, knowing that we, like you said, knowing that we can, knowing that we have, and proceeding with that in mind. That's, that's what I'm hearing. So um, you can comment on that. Well, no, no, I think, I think it's useful, but it's also useful, Randy, that you've got vision as a how for goals. Right. Now, I have a different view, and I'm sure there's three or four other different views here now. Well, I use vision as the action. I know. I know. You're, you're is separate. Vision is action. I understand. But do you see that that's one way of looking at vision? Right. It's not it's not the truth. It's a way. You're right. It's the truth to me. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's exactly my point. It's you right. it, that all of us have these personal interpretations and personal beliefs right. but as but speaking to you as a council we just need to have some clarity 
around what are we as a council talking about when we use the term vision. Now, right. obvious, I'm totally aligned with you that action is key to everything. You know, whatever the whatever goals we set, in the absence of action, there's no possibility. You know, in the ad fact, there's nothing. It's just it's right. just a it's just a machine. So so the idea here though is to be clear that you have vision and goals as separate. That's good. But you hold vision as action. And somebody else, in my case, me, I would say I hold vision as possibility. Possibility is not action. Yeah, so you, I, I think we're, you know, you and I've had so many conversations where we um, uh, have this interpretation of words. Um, so um, probability to me would mean action. The only way I, the only way that I can, um, the only way I can achieve that is by taking some action. Now, I'm not I'm I'm thinking of forward thinking action, not not action based on my past experience. And I think that's I think that's where I'm trying to um, flip internally is to how how to either reword it, rephrase it or reorientate it, but that's how I'm, you know, that's where so, I am on that right so now. So what I'm going to ask and request today, Randy, is see if you could stay open, set aside your traditional action interpretation just set it aside it's not right or wrong just right. push it to the side for a minute and and trust that i am as committed to action as you are right but but my my observation and this is really what started my whole career is people can create all kinds of goals and visions but the things don't get implemented very often or if they do get implemented it usually takes a hell of a long time heck of a long time okay right well as you say that though because i think also envisioning that there that there's a short term and a long term because you're right the long term vision like susa just said um is she's looking at 2045 that's a long term vision of this community and we would all probably agree with that vision the short term vision are to me is what a council creates and does and that's what are we doing in the moment that's moving us forward. Um, so, uh, so again, I um, I'm I'm here to listen and I'm here to learn and grow. So um, I'll no, be open. Please. No, it's great. It's great. And again, I'm 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 trying to show the difficulty when any group of people get together to try to create anything. Is we come into oh, the I conversation agree. with all sorts of different views and and opinions, I agree. and 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 ideas. And then we tend to struggle to try to get someplace and we end up with something. But typically, and I'm just saying it's typical, not always mm -hmm. typical, the implementation issue is where things bog down. Right. You know, the best laid schemes of mice and men. You know, it 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 begins to we struggle against ourselves in many cases to try to accomplish something that we say needs to be accomplished. Well, there's there's also in in that context, there's also a lot of impediments, whether they're man-made um, or not, um, that that might create the prevention of moving something forward. So, yeah. so again, it's it's all possible, um, and and um, and I think this is going to be an interesting like three hours. Okay. Well, let's see let's see where we go from here. We, when we get into when we get into the conversation for possibility, it'll be very rigorous. I promise. Okay. So, but Betsy, you want to jump in? Sure. Thank you. Uh, well, I love vision, <laughs> and I probably, uh, in term, yeah, I just uh, I can see it. It's a feeling for me. It's already happened, and in my own lifetime, uh, which is the cool thing about getting old, you can see how wow, it actually happened. <laughs> so, I'm um, for example. I became a vegan overnight 30 some years ago when I read a book, Animal Liberation, and it was just, I'm, I'm done. And it, and no one I knew, I didn't know how to pronounce the word. Um, I was from the Midwest, meat eaters. My family was in shoe manufacturing. They looked at me like I'd just grown a second head, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, um, and look at it now, you go to LAX, it's like, you know, vegan salads and it's in the salad bar. It's like, that blows my mind. Um, and that, you know, yoga became so popular and that. So I, you know, back to possibility, 
we can do anything, really. I had a dream after Wednesday night, um, the workshop, which was so great. Thank you so much, James. <laughs> um, um, I was in a self-driving car and it was so interesting. I realized this later because my vision in my dream is self-driving car. I'm in the passenger seat. I look over and there's no one there. I'm like, holy shit. Shoot! <laughs> um, there's a panic. There, but my kids are in the back seat. There are people in the car, and and then I all of a sudden calm down and realize, wow, this is so super cool. I, mean, I, I don't like driving. I can sit back and enjoy myself and have a conversation, and and so that that um, you know change creates anxiety. You know, our biologically, you know, we are are put together that way, and that's how we've survived, which is great. Um, um, on the, we have such a great opportunity though, because we're not generally going to get attacked by saber tooth tiger anymore. You know, we can, we've got giant, bigger global issues. Um, so what a great time to see what we want and we would like to survive and thrive and include everybody and, and make it one big happy family. And, uh, I can, I can feel it. So it's a, it's a yeah, and, and and again, the more you could be clear about the future you are committed to, then it, then it creates another opportunity of how do you communicate to someone who doesn't have that same view? They're committed to a different kind of future. Now, now whether whether what you know, it's 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 difficult if you have objectified this because that's going to lead to an argument. Right. Well, yeah. But if you could say. But if you can see the possibility of your future as you envision it and the possibility of Susan's future as she envisions it and Randy's future as he envisions it, we're only going to have one future. Right. There will be a future that has to include all of us, whether we like it or not. And our point of view about the future is not the same as the future. No. You know, what, you know, reality doesn't care what you think. Right. And, you know, it, and yet this is, go ahead. Well, for example, you know, when I, at 23, when I became a vegan, I'm like, this is the way it is. We have to go this way. And now, of course, as I'm learning, we've got a, from what I, you know, we need to get the animals back and grazing. And, um, you know, so it's a, I'm, yeah, I'm not going out to get a steak tonight, although it's it's a shift, you know, it's a pivot. It's and you know, back to where we are today, in order to save ourselves, we've got to do some things that perhaps we didn't even imagine we'd have to do. Yeah. We got to do and, it. And we're all in that process together. You know, I mean, I just I'm I'm like three weeks old in my plant based diet, you know, but it, but it, but 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 you know, it, it took me 70 years to get there. Plus, yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll talk more about it. The main point, I, the principle I want you to get out of this, though, is that vision is not competing. Possibilities don't compete with each other. When it comes to implementing the possibilities, there may be differences that have to be resolved. But at the level of vision itself, vision is an inclusive phenomenon. My vision doesn't have to fight your vision that the phenomenon itself is large enough to hold a lot of diversity let's go on further uh ryan can you turn your camera on yeah i'd, I'd like to suggest we all keep our camera on for the whole conversation if possible would you like to jump in here i don't have anything to say but i'm listening well, I wanted you to start by saying sort of where did you come into the meeting or what are your thoughts about vision or what are your, what would you like to see accomplished here? What would you like um, to get out? What would you like to get out of this conversation? I, a better understanding what everybody wants to see happen. That's it. I, I think that's what we're all here for. Well, that's what you're here for. My, my invitation though, Randy, or Ryan, sorry. My invitation though is to, to speculate and imagine and, and say if you could get anything out of this session besides just understanding where other people are at, what would you wanna get? What would make this worth your time? 
I hope that we can, I mean, understanding what everybody else wants. I mean, I, I'm here to, I, I like listening and hearing what everybody else is thinking. I mean, that's really it. I get a better understanding of what my colleagues want to see happen. And um, I mean, we, we're not here to execute a plan. We're here to talk about plans. That's the way I see it. And I hope we can, I hope I can well, learn more you, about what everybody would like to see. Do, do, do you accept my, my interpretation that leadership is about creating something? I think that's true. I don't think, I think that's, I mean, I don't think that would be the way I would, um, I think that's an overly simplistic idea of leadership, but I don't think that's supposed to include all facets of leadership. But I think that, yeah. I think everything starts with communication and expectations and all faults and all problems that stem between colleagues and interpersonal situations where we're trying to get somewhere. There's always an inherent, a lot of problems always you can draw back in some way to communication and expectations. And I think that's why um, these types of situations are great. I think if the more we can communicate and the more we can align our expectations with each other, understand a little bit better about what we're doing as we move forward trying to do what is a really complicated, awkward job a lot of the time um, that's designed to be five independent multifaceted human beings who all decide things in a awkward consortium of all it takes is a tiny majority to get something done. Um, I think the more we can all talk and, 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 and our expectations and our desires and our, 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 our communication, especially as those things start to work together, that we can accomplish more as a group than we can individually. And I, I agree with you. I, I guess my my what I'm in trying to encourage is a is a a involvement in the context of the conversation we're having, of of what is your expectation, not just simply to understand, but what would you like to produce, create, what would you like the outcome to be, not not your personal understanding of the process, but but what would you if if you could, if you had a magic wand and you could wave the magic wand. What would you like to see produced in the next three hours? I I don't know. I really don't. I, I don't know, Jim. I, I, okay. I'd like to. I'd like to. I, I you know what? I I really I don't. I I hope that what we produce in the next three hours is an understanding of where we're going to be in the next three years. I mean, well, I, I know that's simplistic in a way, but no, that's I great. Think. I think that's pretty close to what I'm thinking. The purpose of the call is as well. But but my point here is to show you is, is that uh, you can when you go into a meeting or when you go into a game, you can sort of wait to the end of the game to see what got produced, or you could go into the game committed to produce something. Now it's my experience in lots and lots of corporate meetings that the culture has created a kind of expectation based on waiting to see what happens that tends to obscure or blind us to the fact that we're creating what happens. So if everybody was in the meeting with the same commitment you just expressed to wait and see what, to understand each other, then you would have a meeting at the end of the, which everybody would have an understanding and not much would have been produced. That's the, that's the line I'm trying to distinguish here is the dif difference between having a spectator conversation about the game or about the process and and sort of put putting on your jersey and saying okay I'll play the game you know if 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 we could if we could do x it would really be a mind blowing meeting now it may or may not happen but it changes it changes and this is the, the reason I'm stressing this point Ryan is it changes the nature of the conversation we have with each other if five people come together to produce something, even if what they're coming together to produce is different between all five of you, you're going to have a different conversation than if you all come together to see what happens. Now, in a minute, I'm going to provoke the conversation for possibility, and I'm just going to say your, your listening will be different depending upon your expectation, as you just said. I'm just inviting you to produce and create an expectation. Yes, Randy. So, Jim, it's interesting. It's interesting um, as you speak because you know I coached for 14 years, 
and um, and we met every Sunday and we game plan. And it, and it's and I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking that um, um, you go you go in not certain you're gonna win, but you're going in to win. And um, and then and and if you were certain that you were going to win, that would change maybe how you went out and instructed and encouraged your players to win, to achieve that. Exactly. I mean, I mean, first of all, obviously you don't know if you win the game or not until it's over. The no, question, yeah. Well, but I'm just saying, but you've got it. But if you're, you know, I never really looked at it as I'm going in because I know I'm going to win. Yeah. Um, I always went into it knowing that we're going to compete. And hopefully if we plan accordingly and adjust efficiently, we're going to win. And that's the um, difference. That's the difference between a goal and a vision. Right. The way you the way you had it before was winning is a goal. Right. If you go in committed, you've already won. That's like going in with a vision. Right. Well, that's what I'm trying to say is I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm trying to apply it to to how I did things in the past. I find it interesting. No, very good. Very good. You're going to do something different. Now, Bill, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to um, state some history. I know you're skeptical of history. No, but, right. um, the, uh, you know, it, it's worth noting that of the uh, goals that we last set, I counted about 80% of them have been accomplished. In other words, the last time we set a, a set of goals as a governance tool to help guide, um, you know, both how we had, you know, just guide all of us in terms of the governance process. We got about 80% of them done as of today, as I, as I look at it. And I've got a whole page of uh, uh, goals uh, that I was um, ready to share. And of course, that, that's, those all are derivative from um, vision and how we state our visions. And I really um, am looking forward to uh, the communication amongst us in terms of goals, I mean, visions, and, and then the goals that are derived from that in terms of the common ground we can define uh, for visions. But Jim, I was a philosophical major, philosophical philosophy major before I switched to economics because uh, I needed to have a, a better chance at a livelihood in the academic world. Uh, uh, but I always uh, kept that um, philosophical construct and foundation uh, in mind. And you and I have a fundamental disagreement about epistemology. Uh, you have uh, defined, I mean, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate that you've been, you know, I suspected as such, and then I see from reading your book, and then I see this, this morning you presented an epistemology, epistemology that is um, fundamentally postmodern. It's fundamentally a rejection of the uh, the ethos that uh, was behind the uh, the Age of Enlightenment in Western civilization. And as such, when you say things like reality is an interpretation and 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 social constructs and stuff, you are you're presenting a a philosophical framework with. Uh, that, that I fundamentally disagree with. And it, it, there's a lot of reasons for that um, in, in terms of the difference between, um, you know, how we aspire to work together to understand reality and the methods by, by which we use that. Uh, I think that uh, the sort of postmodernist approach that you're bringing to this conversation is something that I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to deal with as best I can in terms of the of, of, you know the overall uh, agenda of sharing visions and setting goals. But I want you to understand that uh, one of the problems with uh, you know the postmodernist philosophy that you just that you set set out at the beginning of this conversation is a rejection of scientific method as a means of working together to uh, understand reality. And as such, I fundamentally think it's dangerous. History of the 20th century has shown, I believe, and that's why I think there's a problem with your, you know, being skeptical of history. We learn from history. To not learn from history is basically to, uh, per, is to engage in a modernist hubris about, well, those people in the past didn't know what they were doing. 
So I'm going to try my best, but I just want you to know that I have a, a fundamental disagreement with you about the epistemology of how to define aspiring to understand, acquire knowledge, work with one another. And I am a, uh, I, I don't, I think it's very disturbing to reject the uh, universalist liberal humanist ethos of the age of enlightenment in favor of a, a post off a postmodernist ethos. Yeah, first of all, thank you for your comment, Bill. Let me just clarify something. Uh, in no way am I rejecting history. I'm distinguishing between history and the future in a way that is not deterministic. So, I, and, I, and again, this is not a philosophy course. We could do that as a, you know, offline sometime. But you define but, a philosophical construct. No, no I, 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 I am saying, I'm saying that the idea that reality is a construct does not necessarily reject science. However, it does change a different relationship to science. Now, for purposes of today, I'm only asking, I'm not suggesting what I'm saying is the truth. It's an alternative interpretation. It's ontologically and phenomenologically grounded. It's trying to, it's trying to answer the question, what is action? It's trying to, it's trying, the preposition here is that the future is a function of action. And whether we're talking science or whether we're talking philosophy or whether we're talking something else, the question is, what is action? I am suggesting that action happens in language, that action is commitment, that that's what determines a different future. And our commitments can be a function of our past or it can be a function of how we see the future. Those are choices that we can make as human beings. But I'm not using labels like postmodernist for myself. I don't know. I don't know those labels. I'm not a professional philosopher. However, I would offer you that it's possible to have a profoundly committed appreciation for the importance of the past and learn from it without letting the past determine the future. And I am suggesting that historically, we've all assimilated and brought into a world in which our future is pretty much determined by the past. Now, that's all I'll say about that. My request for today, though, Bill, is see if you could if you could just uh, allow both both interpretations to coexist in the inquiry we're having about our collective future. And at the end of the day, you, you, nobody nobody is is uh, required to buy into anything. At the end of the day, you take it or leave it. I'm going to be as constructive as possible, uh, but I needed to state for the record that I fundamentally disagree with you about the nature of knowledge. Okay, very good, very good. And I'm, and again, I'm, I'm not even trying to argue epistemologically. I'm trying to, to, to introduce an ontological approach to leadership and change to be continued. James, would you like to jump in here and say something? I'll just say, obviously. You know, my role and Matt's role is to uh, is to take that council vision and, and implement it. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to over the next couple hours, you know, getting that clear vision, I think, for us, um, you know, and goals. And I think for us, uh, staff on a staff level over the last couple of weeks with things opening up, we've started to look at what the next year to two years is going to look like. And it's mind boggling, you know, some of the things that we're going to have to try to figure out and do some things that used to be simple things like uh, Ojai Day used to be almost, you know, automatic. And uh, we have to figure out now, like the first question is, does the city want something like that? You know, does the city council want to do something like that? Do we want to change what we've done? And, you know, and that's just one example, obviously not to get hung up on. But, you know, for us, I think for, for me and then to take that to staff, it's like uh, this. I'm really looking forward to this as far as getting, you know, everybody's vision and being able to, to deliver that. So. All right. So let's then segue. Anything else anybody else wants to say or any questions anybody wants to ask? Susan? Well, I just want to say, if I'm getting what you're saying, it's very deep and profound. And um, 
you know, you're basically asking us to let go of our past conditioning, to use Krishnamurti's language, and to be have our mind be, you know, beginner's mind, open mind. Um, and it's not easy, okay? It takes a big, it's a, it's a, to, to do that, you have to have a, a paradigm shift in, in your way of thinking. Well, that's that's the, that's the ballpark of what I am saying, Susan. That's right. And, you know, and now, again, it's easier said than done. You yeah. know, and the world is filled with those kinds of, of wouldn't it be great if we could? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my, only, my only point here is that as a discipline and as a technology and as a body of knowledge, the, 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 the work I am doing is grounded in the fact that we have a choice in how we relate to what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that that's different than reacting to what's happening. And the, and the more we can exercise the choice of how we're being our way of being in the world, the, the more we the more we exercise our relationship to the future, the more power and freedom we have to create it. Yeah. That's that's my experience now. I don't have an I don't have an agenda in terms of what the future ought to be. I have a personal access to it just like everybody else. But the point here is if we're going to create the future, let's start rigorously with just the question of possibility. Because if it's if something isn't possible, then nothing's going to happen independent of that. So from a from a generating discipline we're trying to create a possibility. Now, the way I recommend we proceed in this conversation is someone actually state an example of the of a possibility to which you are committed. And make and let's for the sake of, of discussion, we need to agree on what the time frame of this should be. You know, I think 2045 is so far out, Susan, that it's hard to get your head around it. By the same token, mm -hmm. you could say exactly the same words for 2030. It, you know, the the it, because we're not trying to predict it, we're trying to create it. So my question is, somebody articulate an example of a possibility that you personally get turned on to or that you that, that excites you or that you're enthusiastic about. Yes, Betsy. That the entire planet converts to regenerative agriculture. Okay, let's let's see if we can keep it focused on Ojai for the discussion. Okay. Okay. Oh, it converts to regenerative agriculture. Okay. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm not an expert in that field. It means that um, we grow food in a way that imitates nature. As but is that part of sustainability that you talked about earlier? Um, I have that in my sustainability plan. <laughs> you know, so, uh, that we have regenerative agriculture as part of the schools, hospitals, hotels, uh, all our current orchards become regenerative, diverse orchards and, and uh, home gardens. You know, regenerative agriculture includes the soil, drawing down car, you know, growing tree forests. I think that's what Betsy maybe has, has in mind. Yes. That's part of my vision. As the, the, anybody, as else, anybody else have a specific example? Bill, you mentioned in the, in the call yesterday, the thing about the barn raising. Yes. Yes. Uh, could, could you do your barn raising? Would you mind contributing that as an example? Sure. I, I and I think that's uh, let me embed it in a, in a in a larger vision of of community character. You know, I think what I uh, uh, believe is the one of the best traditions of Ojai community character is the way we come together um, across uh, broad aspects of the community to meet challenges, to meet issues that need to be addressed, but doing it in a community based, imaginative, and uh, a resilient way. This history, this the history of this community has, has been very good at that, and I hope we can continue and deepen that. So when we're dealing with the issue, for example, of affordable housing, we have a piece of land, uh, and this is just one example, Jim. Uh, it's it's not a broad example, but it's an example of how I, I hope we can uh, a vision of how we meet challenges. 
you know, we've been approaching it traditionally, right? We got a piece of land, let's build some affordable housing on it. We even tried turning it over to another agency. Uh, we look at the cost of construction, so on and so forth. So, okay, let's address the problem. How do we come together as a, as a community to address it by sort of a barn, the old fashioned barn raising approach where nobody could afford to build their own barn, but they could all come together as a community and pitch in and get it done. And perhaps we can look at that in a, in a modern way uh, to approach that challenge where we don't have the money, but we have the human resources. And we find a, a way of uh, community-based human capital to meet those challenges in a way that uh, frankly, I don't see anyone else doing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just inviting anybody here to, to add your own flavor to that. Because I could, I could, for example, let me just use this as an example, say we could start with sustainability or we could start with regenerative agriculture. Or we could start with anything. It's just a start. It's, it, it's just a big, the way you begin a conversation for possibility is you say, let's consider the possibility, blah, blah, blah. So let's consider the possibility that in the, in the future, let's say 20, pick a number out of the air, 2040, 2030. 2025. What, what, 2035. <laughs> no, 25. 2025. You get too short, it becomes a fantasy. Okay. okay. But, 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 but let's, let's, let, let's just, let's just arbitrarily say 2030. We could change the, 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 the accordion, the time frame if we want to here. Let's, let's stand in the possibility of 2030 that the community of Ojai has uh, come together in an unprecedented way to take responsibility for homelessness and, un, and housing or un, affordable housing. That just imagine like, imagine a future in which literally that was as much a people as much everyone's personal responsibility as picking up litter you know or something like that 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 people owned the problem and collectively committed to take care of it i mean that's all i'm going to say about that right now not notice i'm not trying to say how yet but that there there was a there was a shift in the relationship of the community to the issue of affordable housing it became everybody's problem and everybody's opportunity now just imagine you woke up not don't imagine you woke up imagine that possibility can everybody do that just hold, can you hold that it's just possibility nod your head if that's if that's can you do that Okay, now don't look at it, look from it. So stand in the possibility that our community has come together and taken responsibility for housing. And tell me what you see. This does not require heavy thinking. It requires look in your head and look in your mind and see what comes to mind. Look, so if you're standing in the possibility that the community has come together and taken responsibility for housing, what do you see? And just speak whatever's whatever you see. Don't don't wait to be called on. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, I think we have a we, we have a metaphorical example that we could expand on. Look what we how we did the playground. But but hold it hold okay. hold it don't, right. hold it. Uh, that's not quite what I'm asking. Don't 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 make a case for it. That's looking at that possibility. I want you to stand in the possibility and look around the rest of the community, look around the other areas. Don't, just don't think about this, just look. What else do you see if in fact that were the case? You if mean it outside were possible. of housing? You mean well, outside yeah, of housing? Yeah, exactly, I don't, this is. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to, how about, I'm trying. Uh, how, about, how about restoring our stream courses? We probably couldn't afford to pay for it, but we can all pull together to do it uh, on a human capital pro bono. Terrific, basis. terrific, that's one. What else do you see, Randy? Uh, I see overcrowding. Now that's somebody you, James, this is where you need to be writing all this down. Okay, so say that again, Randy. I see overcrowding. Okay, you see overcrowding, great. I see. What else, do, Betsy, what do you see? I see a tiny house village over in Bryant Circle that's so 
the model for all tiny house villages. I see all the empty buildings around town restored to work, live spaces. Terrific, terrific. So, so, so that's great. So, so you just each each of you keep looking. Ryan, what do you see? Susan, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? What I see is that um, we've come to the realization the realization that we can provide housing for everyone if we implement car sharing because okay. if we if we start. Uh, allowing... Okay, now, now, now watch. I'm, I'm cutting you off only okay. because don't make the case or argue for what you okay. see. Practice, okay. just see. Oh, I see. All, all the space that would normally devoted to would normally be devoted to parking is now devoted to housing, and in fact, we're taking some of the acres of asphalt around Nordoff and building teachers' housing. Very nice. What else? What else do you see? <laughs> and you don't stop with just one here. Just keep. Keep, well, pull, keep pulling, keep uh, pulling. Bill, Randy, Ryan, what else do you see? What do you see? Standing in the possibility that the community has come together and taken responsibility for housing. Well, we organize all the people that have talent and a passion for building. For, for you know, we have diverse housing. There are people who want to do earth buildings, and we anyway we get all those people together and we provide a place where they can volunteer their time to build that type of housing. We changed the Very codes good. to allow for this. Very good. Now, when you start a conversation for possibility, you're not limited to the original statement. Hmm. You know, stand in the possibility of what she just said, or stand in the possibility of Betsy and her tiny village, which she saw. See what I'm saying? That stand, learn to stand in the possibility. See what else you see. If you stand in the possibility of overcrowding, what do you see? Because it's a possibility. What else do you see? I see a state-of-the-art shelter, houseless shelter that the entire community builds as we did Libby Park and, and embraces and it's in the perfect spot and it's just a model. Good, thank you. Ryan, what do you see? Here. I don't know. I really don't, Jim. I'm, I'm not trying to not participate. I just, you know, just so everybody knows, I, I have a lot um, going on in my existence right now. So I apologize for being a little detached, but I, you know, I, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, we understand that. Randy, what else do you see? What else do I see? Yeah. This, this well, is a well, the easiest thing would be just a better use of of of, of lands in the Ojai community. Okay. Keep keep going. All the store half of at least half of the storage units because people understand that you know about li living in a way that has less impact on the earth. The storage units themselves become converted to housing. Look at all those storage units. Uh, all right. Storage units. What else? <laughs> I see uh, model ADUs everywhere. You know, Randy yeah. sent a vertical. Just, I mean, prefab ADUs through, okay. and the city supports that happening. Again, keep going, Bill. I'd like to see a um, leadership model for the entire valley, where we recognize that resiliency and sustainability is a valley-wide issue, and it needs to be done by a governance element separate from the county and perhaps and beyond the city for the entire valley and consider a, a setting up a, a, a properly designed district uh, with some tax support, basically open space recreation and preservation okay. uh, that would, would include bringing all possible lands, including county lands under that surveillance and resiliency management like Sewell okay. Park. So now stand in that possibility of standing in a, in a sustainable, resilient uh, community that's got a, a, a governance model or a governance structure and practice practices that allows to sustain and maintain and generate that. At Keep the valley level, yes. At the valley level and stand in that possibility and see what you see. That's what I see. Uh, that's, what, that's what you see, but now I, I'm not, I, the key here is that I'm trying to, to, fo to focus on, don't look at that statement, look from that statement. If that were the, if that were truly possible, what else would you see? 
I mean, in terms of what we could done that way. No, what else would you see about the community? What would you see in any domain in any direction that you're looking? You just just if, if that were the case, then X, Y and Z might also be the case. What do you just it's not this is not an analytical question. It's a it's a it's kind of like a brainstorming question. Mm -hmm. What what else do you see? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, I, that's a statement of a possibility. That's that's right. No, I agree. I love it. I'm just simply saying, having stated that possibility, the practice, the exercise, is then take that possibility on, own it, live it, wrap it on like a suit of clothes, and look around and see what other possibilities that allows you to see that you don't see now, or that you haven't thought about. If anything, I, I don't I don't have anything else to say right now on that. Okay, very good. So keep going, so, Betsy. I see rent stabil stabilization and a living wage for everybody, and that's just what we do here, and that's okay. how people can live. Now, all these statements, if 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 we were in a live in a live meeting, uh, I would be writing on a on a flip chart. You know, and and you know we've got a a dozen statements so far, all of which are possibilities. And nobody had to think about them. They just were there from that point of view, from that vantage. These statements you're making are, are possible, but they're only possibilities at this moment. And now nobody has to commit, buy in, or agree with any of them. It's a, in a conversation for possibility, what you're trying to do is create a different opening or a bigger opening for the future to show up. You're trying to generate the future as a possibility. Now, at the end of the day, this all needs to be brought together and massaged in a way that gives you some kind of a coherent statement of vision. But we're defining a space, we're defining an opening, we're defining a possibility of what, what if. What if we could create Oh, hi, being the way we want it to be in the future. What's possible? And again, starting from if this is possible, then I see other possibilities. Are not a specific possibility, but I'd be, it'd be negligent to not to pass over the opportunity. We need to define how to do economic development that doesn't forsake our history of, of, of cultural visitation, artistic content, uh, you know, our art, artist content, but build on that in a way that allows a um, more people to live and work here in the valley and not have to commute in and out. Right. Fabulous. Now, just state that as a positive. So you, you said this, that's what we need, but you're stating a possibility. Yes. So possibility and of the implications a, from that in terms of how we uh, of make an policies. An integrated yeah. economic model that allows people to live and work in the community. Right. So Jim, yeah. Jim, I'm getting confused here because these seem like goals. You know, you asked Bill a moment ago to stand in the middle of, of uh, recognizing resiliency and sustainability or a valley-wide issue, open space. You said, so stand in the middle of that and what does it look like? No, no, that wasn't my question. No, that's what I'm saying is he made a statement or a goal and I thought the idea was that this is a vision. Now stand in the middle of that statement and what does it look like? I understand what you're hearing or what you're hearing. I'm, I'm not seeing that. I just saw another goal put up here. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I'm seeing another goal by rent stabilization. I'm seeing another goal. And so I'm getting confused here is are these goals or are these visions? I'm, at this moment, I'm defining them and holding them as possibilities. Well, it is a possibility of goal. First, first of all, nobody's even committing to anything yet. And I'm and the, the, the thank you, Randy, because the, the point I'm trying to make is that possibilities are not goals. OK, now what Bill said was he sees a possibility. I did not ask him to tell me what it looked like. I didn't ask him to expand. What does it look like? Oh, pardon me? You asked him to stand in it. And what in does it. it look like? That's what no. I'm no, I asked him to stand in it, and then the question was, what else do you see? The, 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 it, this is a counterintuitive kind of way of, of, of relating to the future. It's, it's like, oh, I got it. Well, if we have a, uh, 
a future in which we have an economically sustainable uh, or our, econo our, com our community economics are sustainable and allow people to live and work in the community. That's a possibility. What else do I see there? And then somebody might say, I see the possibility of affordable housing. It has nothing to do with the economic model directly necessarily. But the, the, the model, the exercise here is to keep practicing, looking, looking, looking at what's possible, what's possible, what's possible. Now, after we've done this for a while, we need to make some commitments or own it or say, does this capture, does, does this collection of statements capture the future in the community that we want? Is this, does, do these statements represent the future of Ojai as a possibility today? And, and then are you as a council individually and collectively committed that this is the future that we are committed to, to manifesting? To, to bringing into existence. Yes, Bessie. Um, that it's bilingual. Um, our, everything's bilingual in that there there's a, a real acknowledgement and recognition about the Shumash people. This is okay. Uh, Very good. So let's can we keep going? Bill, anything else from you? Not at this time. Um, I see the economic basis as education in in every form, lifelong learning education. Our you know our we our, our private and uh, public schools are thriving because we have housing, and and the found but the foundation I think can be captured in education, art, regenerative agriculture, permaculture, and holistic health care. And the things that, that allow the community to thrive are the very things that would draw in long-term uh, sustainable tourism. And our, our hotels themselves would be model uh, sustainable hotels. Very you know, good. Have green, you know, deep green practices. Very good. So that the footprint of both the, uh, the, low, the people that live here and visitors is as light as possible. Very good. So keep going, keep staying in the question, what possibilities do I see? For example, do you see anything about water? So now just keep scanning around, looking at different dimensions of life in, in the in community. You know, do, yes, do, if, I, if I say I see the possibility of being self-sufficient in, in drinking water. Now, if you stand in that possibility, what do you see? Well, we would have to re recirculate our our gray water, our our used water. You know, every home and hotel and business would have a means to re to um, re recirc recirculate water. Yeah, so you and see, you, you and capture water. So you see, you see the gray waters all being recirculated. Great. What else do you see? I, I see a restored watershed that's flowing beautifully and we're all in community supporting that watershed and sharing what we have. Very good. Yeah. And we were, Keep. you know, everything is connected. So our, our agricultural practice and our forests that, you know, would, would be capturing water, would be, um, what's the word, you know, cap, I want to say capturing water, but they're, but they are part of the water cycle. Our ability to have rain is related to how we to to the, the plants to the plant life to the trees. Great. Now you can keep going. Now, what else do you see about the governance system or the the government? The, the how governance occurs in the valley. What else do you see in that way? I see super just completely transparent and we're all working together on the same team and uh, really excellent communication and accountability and uh, team, it's a team. Very good. This may be too detailed, Jim, but uh, I do believe there's a fundamental problem, governance problem, achieving resilience and sustainability in this valley because the city of Ojai is so small 
relative to its natural service area, our sphere of influence. And I think a tool towards resilience and sustainability, we have to give serious consideration to not being the smallest ratio in all of Ventura County and look at some annexation to improve the uh, ability of our governance in the city to achieve those goals. Now, that's great. So can you say that? So I see the possibility of annexing how much? You see you. Right now we're 53% of our natural service area. Uh, we have issues, for example, where people across the street from one another are facing different governance structures on some real essential issues like in the Arbolata. Uh, and uh, I think that, um, you know, the, uh, just from the standpoint of neighborhood integrity and addressing issues like um, the threat of uh, septic discharge into our aquifer, so, uh, so, we need, so can, at, can, we need to look at some governance reforms in terms of annexation. Can you say that again? I'm asking you to see if you can language that. Can you say it as I see the possibility of us having annexed all of the, the land in our service area? Yes. Okay, great. That, that's a different statement than you get into the mechanics of how does it look and what are you going to do about it? Right. So, but so let's, so if you stand in the possibility that we are now have annexed uh, everything in our service area, what do you see from that point of view? You know, this is a, an instrumental detail you might find too too small, but that ratio is the fundamental issue behind why we're paying so much for uh, law enforcement services uh, and taking money away from serving other resiliency and yeah. sustainability goals, for example. Exactly. Now, again, none of, that's, Randy, this is an example why I'm saying it's a possibility and not a goal. It, it could become a goal, but right now it's just a possibility. So if, if, there is a, if there is an authentic possibility that we could annex everything in our service area, then downstream in the next conversation we have, it's gonna be, you know, what, what, do, what do we need to actually deliver in order to have that possibility be reality? So the skill base here is really, how do you translate vision into reality? The first thing is to not confuse them. Reality is not the same as possibility. So if you don't confuse reality and possibility, then the game is, okay, we have a possibility. It's not predictable. Okay, it's probably unreasonable. History would probably tell us it's not gonna happen. Okay, it's a dream, it's an ideal, you know, history tells us probably it will become a, you know, a 20 year debate. On the other hand, if you stand in the possibility, then you start creating a different scenario or a different strategy or a different uh, way of approaching it to translate that possibility into a reality. You know, we, we've worked with companies in which, you know, they, they've used every engineering solution they can to reduce a time frame, say from six months to, to, to a month. And by using this particular way of thinking, are able to reduce it to three or four days. So the, the amount of the, the amount of elasticity in terms of the human capability to create a future and implement and deliver is enormous. You know, and so the opportunity here is to keep engaging our creative muscle to see, okay, if this is a real possibility of annexing everything in our service area, and if what that would mean is we'd be able to also do X, Y, and Z then let's do it. You know, um, you know, Jim, um, my design philosophy is dream the dream. And that's the same as possibility. Yep. Okay. Then what happens is you dream the, the dream and you design to it. Then you come back into the reality of what can you afford or what can you afford slash control, you know, um, so I'm seeing all of these dreams in front of me. And, um, and again, I guess I'm where I'm looking at is these are all great dreams and they're all great visions. Um, so is the next step to process these dreams or, or visions as to something that's attainable? Um, or are we still dreaming? So Randy, this is, this is great, Randy. So let me just quick answer 
when you say is it attainable, you're saying it like a fact. If you're if you're does if you're living that dream, and you don't have the budget, then you have a breakdown called how am I going to raise the money. If you don't hold it that way, then not having the money is an excuse to abandon the dream. No, there's other ways of doing of, of achieving the dream. Well, as long not as abandoning stay, it. As long as you stay anchored in the dream, that's great. We're on the same okay. page, Susie, and then uh, or Betsy, and then Susie, Susie, yeah. Susa. Yeah, I I, I want to add that all all uh, you know the possibility that we have a valley wide speed reduction. Because in our, our narrow street, that we have all the residential streets, our slow streets, and we create a valley <coughs> where young children can move safely everywhere through the entire valley without mm -hmm. being hit by a car. Very good. <laughs> Betsy? Oh, yeah, it's slow high. But, um, I, I see, um, uh, in terms of governance, uh, it's a real place of inclusion and diversity. Uh, people of every color and age and sexual orientation and where we it's welcoming and and um, yeah find that find the balance so that everyone feels included and welcomed as well as mentored to contribute. So so far we've been talking about possibilities in housing. We've been talking about possibilities in energy and resilience. In agriculture and in and safety, in governance. Any other areas of community concern? Any other areas where you think there's possibility? I, I see. Or, or you see possibilities. I see public transportation and uh, getting rid of cars for the most part, and uh, ride sharing and uh, walk and ride your bike and everybody's healthier and happier. So now these are examples, again, I keep going to say possibility over and over again. It's just possibility. It's improbable, unreasonable, unlikely, and generally speaking, isn't going to happen. On the other hand, that's only based, that's only based on history. On the other hand, if you say, aha, we, the council, are committed to some of that, in the face of that difficulty, then you have then you have a new game of of how do we translate a, an unreasonable possibility into a reality, whether it's governance, whether it's safety, any of these things is is they're just pure possibility, and you've not committed to any of them yet. Okay, but if but that's why I say if you're not committed to these things, they're just brilliant ideas. They're just a, it's just a laundry list of good ideas. It's a wish list. Okay, so anything else? Yes. Um, I see that the City Hall campus is this beautiful community space um, where we're in nature and kids are learning and growing food and animals and uh, supporting help of Ojai. And it's this real place of um, an art and it's this real model of, um, and as well as Chaparral, um, higher education, town square, place to hang out and meet, cafes, um, it, where we are at, you know, the, where we're learning and teaching what we know. Beautiful. Okay, great. Anything else? What else? Can I add to Be Betsy's statement on Chaparral that there's a potential there to make that a place like uh, Esalen Institute? or smaller on a smaller scale. And then I was I want to address our one of our largest open spaces in front of Nor Nordoff, the Cardi property, that the community finds a way to own that property, keep it as parkland, open space, a dog park, and green burial site. Very good. Got it. Okay, great. Anybody else? So the the point is if you look at the at the piece of paper or the uh list that's being created on this on the screen okay green green burial site not just a green site <laughs> sorry sorry <Okay>. Jim. <laughs> but here now we can we can keep going we can keep going and and, and maybe you want to keep going One but can more. you 
Yes, please. But uh, easements all over town so that um, everyone can have access to the trails. You don't have to get in your car. You can just um, walk. All right, good. All right, anybody else? Any other possibilities? <clears throat> How about Jim, uh, uh, the possibility of having a fire um, hardened Ojai? Nice, very good, great, got it. And again, stand in that. If we had a, hard, a fire hardened uh, Ojai, what else do you see from that point of view? I see, for example, probably a different set of relationships with other government entities, other government entities, uh, much more of a partnership than a, than a, you know, a siloed kind of structure. So much more, much, much more proactive, interactive uh, collaboration amongst multiple government entities. Yeah, I failed to mention my possibility included a fire protection uh, function on a, on a valley-wide level. The, Great. I mentioned sure. the, the land use of valley-wide special district. Very good. Very good. What else? Any other possibilities? Uh, State-of-the-art uh, humane laws for the animals as a real model. Okay. What else do you see? Driving businesses and uh, business cooperatives working together. Yeah. I could see I could see the city of Ojai as a case study in the uh, Harvard uh, School of Public Administration. Yeah, you know, things like that. So it, you know, whatever what other possibilities you see. I see everything that we're doing as as a, the as a compre creating a a, a total model sustainable community for the whole world and and, nope. and that and that to me that's a very real potential so that our 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 tourist industry and our sustainability become merged very good okay now if you look at this list what have you got you've got a list of possibilities you know you you aren't necessarily committed to all of those possibilities you may not be committed to any of them, but that but possibility does not require you agree with it or be committed to it or not, but it's there like a possibility. So as you begin to convene and reflect on, okay, what is the, the summary statement in a way that captures the one, the, the essence of that, of that statement? They're all possible. Another principle here that I found is that if you can find the two or three or four key statements there that you all already kind of naturally are drawn to, you could then, the staff or, or a subcommittee can then begin to massage the language to begin to come up with something like Susa was trying to say at the beginning, which kind of captures the whole of the possibility that you're creating. And then once that statement is articulated and wordsmithed a little bit, then you, the council, can then formally commit to that language. But here's the point, whatever the language is, it encompasses all of this. That again, possibility is not something that is it occurs like in pieces. You know, the possibility of, of running a marathon includes diet and fitness and relationship and self-esteem and a million other things that could be connected. And as Susan said earlier, I think lots of everything's connected to everything else at some level. But for purposes of the practical generation of an organizational statement that encompasses the core expression of the possibility, and I'm, using, I'm introducing another, temp, another principle here, introduces the possibility that we are. That in my experience, vision at the end of the day is an expression of who we are. Again, Randy, it's a difference between a goal and a vision. It's a come from, it's a ground of being. It's the, it's the foundational commitments that orients us to everything else. 
So when this statement gets wordsmith or when when these these items get wordsmith, what what's being called for is can we as individual leaders in the community and members of the council commit ourselves to that statement? Now, what's true here, I think, is that some of these turn you on and some of these don't. Because we're different individuals. So you don't have to be committed to everything, everything that was stated here. You just have to have enough here to, to imagine yourself in the future that you're committed to. In other words, you have to find your vision, your personal vision, has got to be able to fit inside whatever the council comes up with as a whole. It doesn't have to encompass the whole thing. It just needs to be included enough. It needs to be clear enough and the statement that ultimately gets crafted out of this needs to be clear enough that each of you can individually find your future, your vision inside that statement. I may not personally care about housing, but I care a lot about safety. Or I care a lot about governance, but I don't care a whole lot about you know policy, certain kinds of policies. But as long as I can find my what I am, what I am committed to the possibility that I am committed to the future that I am committed to inside that statement. That's that's all that we can expect and all that's required. Because then we then we then we can begin to take the next state to start talking about how do we organize the, the council? How do we organize our governance system? How do we go? You know, how do we work with staff? How do we how do we create? The organizational capability to translate this into reality. Any questions or comments or thoughts about this? I just add one thing, Jim, to the list. Um, a beautiful public swimming pool, uh, maybe a couple, and a new uh, an improved skate park. So it's updating the skate park, having a scooter park for the little guys next next to it. Um, there's some kind of bike riding track that you can make that sounds super cool in Seoul Park. Okay. Uh, <laughs> great, great. Somebody else, Susie, you had your hand up? Oh, I want to suggest it's it's uh, 1040. Could we take at least a three minute break at some point, e either now yeah, or the next We'll minutes? take one in just a couple of minutes because then okay, uh, it, once, once we finish this part of the conversation, then okay. I think we're going to shift to actually looking at what mm -hmm. are the goals and this is where it's a little bit artificial here. If you can imagine that we've wordsmithed this and created a, a coherent statement, and if we could all stand in that statement, then the question is what kinds of goals would we had would we have had to accomplish in order for this to be reality? Remember the statement is how do we translate vision into reality is really where the rubber hits the road. Bill? I wanted to add a possibility. Finding a way to have a joint powers management, sustainable management of our watershed and not cede that authority to an outside agency like a court appointed special master or something, keep it local. Have a Good. find a way to come together with a, a joint powers management of our of our watershed on a sustainable basis. Good. And stating that as a possibility is that we have, I see the possibility of having a joint powers water management process in place as a possibility. Correct. Yeah, that's great. Susan? I, so I just want to, I, 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 it, it seems like I keep hearing you say, maybe you don't care about some of this, but as council members, it's we almost have to care about all, all of these things because they they're, these are all the things that come before us in the course of our term, in the course of a meeting, we may not be personally interested in something, but we have to care en about it enough to educate ourselves and to do what we feel is best for the community. We don't have the option of dismissing anything, really. Well, Does that makes sense. <laughs> sure, but you, you, there's different ways of looking at this, Susan. My yeah. my own personal suggestion here is caring is a choice. When you when you say I have to care or we're supposed to care. Well, I care you know, about all the things. Well, I but, thought, but, but, I, I, that's no, why no. I, when you say you may not care about all those things, 
I do no. care about all those. Well, things. no, and I think that's great. I'm not saying <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't, I'm, but I'm yeah. I, I'm saying you need to also be open that other people have the choice, and who may not care the way you care. Okay. And and so it's just part of how you collaborate in anything is is being committed that everybody's entitled to their way of seeing it and their view and how they yeah. hold it. And as soon as you start to put imperatives on other people's behavior or particularly their way of being, yeah. you know, then you're going to you're going to get into to trouble. So so the idea here is to is to be able to express what you said without making it a mandate. Yes, like, like we should. Yeah. Very yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Oh, well, we've gotten off gas and oil and we're totally electric and solar. Solar. Yeah. All right. Good. Great. <laughs> Got it. Anybody else? Randy? Oh, I'm good. Okay, so can everybody get your head around this list enough to imagine that collectively it expresses a whole vision? This is a vision. Right now it's too too hard to think. You can't think at all. Mm -hmm. But can you get the space of this? That's what I'm asking. Can you can you can you experience and, and appreciate that what you've created here is a vision. It is the future as a possibility. I'd like to hear from everybody here. Can you can you can you can you get that relationship to what we're doing here? That the collectively this is a vision. It's not finished. Yeah, it may not be internally consistent, but it's a vision. Well, yeah, and and it's going to be where where there will be differences to be resolved and specifics is at the implementation end of the pipe at the cre at the vision end of the pipe it's just possibility ryan is that clear just ahead and randy yeah yeah okay so so after the after a short break what i'm going to propose is that we then imagine and this is where it's going to be a little cumbersome and we have to sort of let our imagination go I want to imagine that this vision is already a reality. That's that's the that's going to be the project. You have to create this. It's not true. You have to take the case. You have to be able to to own the idea. Sort of like the coaching example earlier, Randy, that the game is already won. Gandhi, Gandhi uh, Mahatma Gandhi famously said, if you want the future to happen, be the vision. Be the vision. Come from that it's already reality. So on one level, it's not reality. It's just pure possibility. But the first step toward in the direction of bringing it into existence is to say, okay, it's not reality, but what if it were? What if this was already a fact? What if Ojai really looked like this? In all the different ways you expressed and probably another hundred ways you haven't expressed yet. Because once you start getting into the game of creating vision and creating the future, a huge number of un unanticipated things begin to occur that you never would have thought of before. So this is this is an exercise in creating the future. Now, the second half of this call is going to be about goals, milestones, and, and other questions like who did what, when. But but I, I'm asking you to see if, if if we have a sufficient mass here that you can you can kind of get that there's a vision here. Not not wordsmith yet. Is that is that acceptable, Bill? I, I've already stated I. You okay? I mean about you know I I'm kind of a person about logic and internal consistency and you got to work that out first before you have a a, 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 a sensible vision. Well, again, if, only if you objectify vision. If you as long as you hold vision as possibility. It doesn't have to be internally consistent. There we are on our uh, disagreement about the nature of knowledge and how do we aspire to learn it, Jim. 
Well, okay. I'm just saying possibilities are possibilities. They don't compete with each other. The possibility of winning is the same as the possibility of losing as a possibility. Okay, let's 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 leave that uh, qualification and stipulate. I got it. And let's now take a five minute break and then come back and continue the next part of the conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim. And you may anybody uh, you may want to mute your microphones while you're on the break.
we're all back except the mayor. <clears throat> Yes, I believe so. While we're waiting, I'd like to announce that I just found out my niece had a nine pound, one ounce baby last night. Wow. A big boy. Big girl. <laughs> no, big girl. <laughs> Congratulations. That's exciting. Yeah. Very. Okay. Well, and I'd like to announce that I turned 67. Oh, okay. uh, and day. I will be sharing today with my lovely grandchildren. And tomorrow with some of my best friends. It'd be real interesting to see how this all plays out. <laughs> Happy Bridget, birthday and stay safe. Yeah. Happy birthday, Randy. Happy birthday. And, uh, you don't look like a, you don't look a day over 50, uh, Randy. I, I and I feel that. Um I'd I'd also like to um, you know, Councilman Blatz has a lot on his mind. And I personally would have no problem if Ryan needed to leave or or take the rest of this session off. Um, I'm just stating that for him, he can speak for himself. Um, and myself, I'm only staying until 12 o'clock today. I have um, a lot of other things that I need to do. So I'm just letting everyone know that. Um, so as we work to this next, looks like hour, that um, that we accomplish as much as we can. Well, I'm committed we'll, be, we'll go no longer than, than 12. Okay. Uh, and and uh, Councilman Blatz, you're certainly welcome to leave if, if you need to. I'm committed to being here as part of the job. and. Um, I apologize for not participating more. I appreciate what you said, Randy, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll stick around. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the, the the next question then is is in, in if what if we if we st if we have a vision captured by all that language, and we imagine that it's already occurred, uh, what happened or what would have to happen in order for it to be accomplished? Now traditional planning traditional conventional planning usually starts in the present, imagines a future out in front of us, projects trend lines and history into the future, and then makes commitments based upon what can be predicted. What I'm suggesting we are doing here now and what the possibility is, is to adopt or practice a different mindset for planning and in in this in this approach what you're doing is is imagining the future's already occurred like going into the game having already won and then rigorously inventing a scenario of how did you accomplish it so the question is shifting from how do i get there to how do i get here all of you could write a pretty rigorous, detailed life story to tell how did you get where you are. What this is simply being able to to move your move your mind into the future, and continue to tell the story of how did you get there, how do you get here? Now, let me show you one other mindset part of this. Most, and I'm saying most of us. Most of us would agree that we're pretty busy right now. Is that fair? Would you nod your head if that's true? Nobody has a lot of free time on their on their plate. And you imagine a future that there's going to be more opportunity in the future, more more freedom to make new commitments, more freedom to do things. So we live with a relationship to the future that the present is confined and the future is open. Now, another way of thinking of it is when you get to the future, everything will be very specific. Everything will be assertable. So when you get to 2030, there won't be any choice at all. On, on a given date, let's say December 30th, 2030, everything will be fixed like a still uh, photograph. You know, you'll be exactly where you are. The community will be exactly where it is. The governance system will look however it looks. The land will be whatever it is. The, the housing will be whatever it is. The, the water and the, and the agriculture will be whatever it is. There'll be almost no variability on, on the date 2030. Can you see that or not? You agree with that? Yeah, they will need us. Well, it's just, it'll be fixed. Because if you, if, you if you look at it that way, <laughs> the, the only time you have a choice to do anything different than you would already do is now. 
action happens in the present. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Oh, yeah. Anybody disagree with that? So if action happens in the present, right now today is the only day that you could possibly have an impact on the future. We lost you. I can't hear him. Jim, your, your Jim, sound's your, gone. Yeah, your audio disappeared, Jim. Jim, Jim. Oh, I don't think I don't think he can hear us either. <laughs> Jim, your sound's gone. No sound. Jim. Here, post a note uh, upside down or an in, inverted note post. Oh. I think, he, I think his headphones might have. Uh... Uh, James, do you have his cell? Yeah, that's what I was just going to look for. I have it. Somewhere. Is that Perry? Hello, hello. Oh, but now you're back. Yeah, Jim, we lost you for a second. I think you're maybe your headphones. Okay, where did you lose me? Uh, about 30 seconds ago. Okay, well, my only point here is, is that our normal mindset is we the, the present is fixed and the future is open. I'm saying another way of looking at it is the future is fixed and, it, and the only place there's any freedom or opening is in the present. And since action happens only in the present, this is a very useful flip in terms of how we normally approach planning. Now let's put up slide 72 just to summarize this statement I just made. We'll pull it up now. Danny, Danny. Okay, th this, this approach has been used in literally thousands of organizations and it's called the Merlin methodology. It is not the same as reverse planning. This is not the same as re you know, pick, a, pick a future and then figure out backwards, how did, you, how did it happen? This is, this is a methodology where you stand in the future if it's already happened, like the game is already won, and then you project your mind back to the beginning to the present. So if we're if we're standing in if if the future here is 2030, and it and it embodies and encompasses everything that you've just expressed, and you now look back to 2021, that's the left side of the screen, and you ask the question, what happened? How did we get here? That's the that's the exercise. Now one of the things you'll say, or what were past tense, the milestones that we had to meet in order to be here. Now, as I say, given that we haven't finished wordsmithing the vision, this is gonna require a little bit of creative imagination. So operate as if we have done that. And then look back to, 20, to today, 2021 from 2030 and say what had to happen. So then uh, you can put up slide 77. Not seeing it. I'm not seeing it either. Give us a second. Well, the, the only only point here is that when we ask this question, if 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 we had the technology and the staff's going to have to do this with notes, uh, you could be very specific, and, I, and I'll do it this way: like, what had to happen in 2021 in order for us to get to that vision, or for that vision to occur? Or let's, if we take, uh, uh, if we take any one of the things that you said, pick one. Uh, Bill, when you said you see a, a shared powers agreement, okay, governing water in, in the valley in, in our in our region. Uh, if if you take that as a, a slice of the vision, and say it's already real in 2030 look back and say what had to happen in 2021 for that joint powers agreement to occur let's just take take this one and test it so what what would you see looking from the future would have had to have happened in 2021 22 23 24 25 26 all the way up to 2030 but let's just focus on the first couple of years okay what would have had to have happened for that to have been, to have to have occurred. Well, you have to start with uh, 
people in, a, in, in authority and various agencies starting to talk to each other about how to cooperate on specific small actions to then find a way to explore the trust level to get to the larger joint powers agreement. Okay, so again, keeping keeping ourselves oriented from the future, looking back, people would have had, from the different agencies would have had to, to to communicate with each other. Now, now a way of thinking about this: think about you're remembering something. Like Bill, I remember that there was that that in a in the in the March uh, council meeting, you declared the possibility of a joint. Uh, agreement, and the council supported that that resolution. I then remember that you called and convened a meeting in April of 2021, where all of the uh, accountable people in the different agencies appeared. Do you remember that? I understand where you're going. Yeah. I, I, well, then, just, uh, then we identified. Then we identified um, the specific areas that we, that impacted, adversely impacted the watershed. Very good, that's great. Now, now again, we could continue this, so, and then who was accountable for that, uh, that gathering? Who was, who was accountable for the commitment we had, that we, that we, you, the council created for the uh, uh, joint uh, shared, Shared Powers Commission or Shared Powers Agreement. Do you remember? Do you remember who was accountable? Well, well, it's interesting. Fundamentally, all of us as a governance group. Right, all five of us committed ourselves to the Joint Powers Agreement with all agencies um, that are in conflict with the Ventura County Watershed. Very good. Now, as, as I recall. That one of the things, again, I'm not going to go down this tunnel very far. When you have multiple accountabilities, it's very easy for the people to get blindsided by each other's views. And, and so it's important to have one accountable. It can be shared with other people, but, but you need someone that you, the council, count on to kind of carry the, carry the water for this particular kind of commitment. Well, that has to be the mayor. <laughs> It, it, well, it, it doesn't have to be anything. It, the point here is, is who is it that you're going to look to to keep visibility and, and and clarity around this is something we committed to make happen. Now, so all I'm saying is you don't have to do this today, but I'm saying at some point you probably want to be clear who is accountable for the various things that you're trying to bring into existence. Yes, the account the the responsibility is clearly the council as a whole and as an entity but the work doesn't get done by you as a group the work gets done by individuals doing things talking about making requests making promises well now that's that's where the action is so again jim this to me is one of those um one of those visions where um there is a, a lack of accountability because of the fact that we're not talking about being accountable specifically to the community of Ojai. We are talking a greater accountability to the regional aspects of water in our community. That's where, the, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I remember something like this happened. We thought we had two people that were going to be accountable to it. They took it to a county supervisor and then he ran with it. And ultimately that group collapsed. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you want accountability and you want us to be specific about who we want in our group to be accountable. Um, and, and I agree with you. So for instance, if we went to OBGMA, we made a decision as a council to place Councilman Wyrick as the accountable person to that committee or that group with an alternative in in our uh, mayor. Um, the, I see that accountable. So Bill is accountable in how he interacts with that group and how he reports back to the council 
as a whole, and then we weigh in and provide direction if needed. Uh, is, is that that's, what that's, you're, the, I mean, that's, that's what, what I'm yeah, That's kind of what I'm talking about. I mean, and for me, accountability means count on ability. The person that we're going to account on to hold our commitment and let us know if there's anything that's in the way or that something goes off the rails or if right. there's a breakdown so that we can mobilize new conversations to be able to focus on whatever's missing to, to keep the ball rolling. Right. Now, again, this is all predicated on my belief, at least, that nothing happens in the absence of commitments. So the best intentions are fine, except if, if they don't turn into action, they're, they're not going to go anywhere. So, so at some point, if we are serious about creating a joint powers agreement, there's a date in time by which that agreement exists or it doesn't. Now, we, we're talking 2030 is the scope for the vision. But Bill, for example, when, when in time would you, do, do you recall, looking from the future, that the joint powers agreement was actually finished in place? Looking mm -hmm. again, standing in the future, when did it happen? When was the agreement finished? Speculating? Imagining, <laughs> imagining. Okay. Imagining. About the, uh, how about by the end of 2023? Good. Now, just for the sake of the, of the game here a little bit, Bill. See, so I remember we finished it at the end of 2023. Okay, just, it takes the, the, uh, the, the, the silliness out a little bit. So let's say, I see that it was ended in, in, in December of 2023. Is that correct? Am I hearing you correctly? Right. And I'm thinking it would require court approval and all that kind of thing. That's right. We have, we have, we're going to go there just a second. Now, if, if somebody else in the group knows more, has different information, or has a strongly different view, you could easily say, wait a minute, Bill, let's, let's say this sounds too optimistic to you. You might say, wait a minute, Bill, I remember that was actually 2024. And so we can negotiate time frames and how the scenario, because all we're doing is creating a story, creating a, a scenario. At the end, we want to commit to it. And if you commit to it, it's an action plan. So now you could telescope in to, to the end of, let's say, 2023. We have a joint powers agreement. It's in place. Now, what did we do in order to do that? So, Bill, when was the legal uh, framework uh, 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 drafted. Oh, that would have to uh, that would have to be uh, sometime in this year to get the first draft. Oh, I good. So when in 2021 did we finish the first draft? Mm -hmm. Because that would be the instrument to be. Uh, uh, I, I can't tell you. Oh, <laughs> you got to you got to make it up. You got to you got to look from. Uh, we're creating a scenario, and that needs to be specific, for it to make any sense. Oh, Bill, I remember it was October 31st. Very good. Okay. So now, now it was done in October 1st. Now, who, who, who was the, the primary person that was doing the, the drafting? Oh, the city manager, if I remember correctly. Okay. James, do you remember it that way? I remembered it being the city attorney, but <laughs> I was going to say, I remember the city attorney doing that. Okay. So just Matt, out of curiosity, when did they, uh, when did they change Sigma to be able to do this? So, so Matt, do you remember when you drafted that framework by this October 31st? In order to have it uh, completed by October 31st, my recollection is that it would have been prepared and circulated to the council in August of 2021. Very good. So and I remember that's the way I remember that too. So the so the draft was was circulated at the at the August meetings. Now I remember that in that uh, visioning workshop that you all got through, you actually uh, instructed James to put that on the agenda for August. Now, oh, no, Jim. I think you're wrong there. I think we instructed James to bring it back to council in uh, April so that we had time to discuss it and then. To <laughs> Okay, very good. That's that's great. So what you what we're doing is we're ha we're now shifting from having had a conversation for possibility that we're now having a conversation for moving that possibility into reality. And Ryan's right. It, it's going to take more research to figure out how to get fit it within Sigma than April is going to allow. Okay, so I can I can remember that Ryan suggested we needed some more research, and who did the research? And oh, when if did I that? Uh, correctly, Russ Baggerly said Sigma didn't matter. 
Oh, come on now. Don't be snarky, Randy. Okay, now look, you you can you can you can do you can do this with any element of the vision. Any element of the vision. Now, if you look at it in terms of milestones, like the like the the completion of the legal framework, that's a goal. And now going back to present time, looking forward, we have a goal to complete a legal framework by October 31st of this year. Proposed. Pardon me? Proposed legal framework. Proposed legal framework. Yeah. Now, now I'm just suggesting that that's the way we think about, or that you think about goals. Goals are actually commitments. Because again, we're creating a scenario, that's fun. You can actually have a lot of fun creating those scenarios. But at the end of the day, are you committed to that 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 scenario? If you are, you have a plan. And then it's a matter of execution of that plan. Um, Jim, can I ask a meta question or is that out of sure. bounds right now? No, nothing's out of bounds. How does this distinct from Peter Drucker's management by objective? What were the exercise you were going through right now? Peter Drucker's mindset in management by objectives was I'm standing here in 2021 looking forward to 2020, 2030. And I'm gonna now from this point, from this vantage point, I'm gonna formulate objectives that I want to accomplish on the on the journey there. So if so that's the, the the framework within Drucker's thinking in most planning, frankly. Most planning is today is 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 the day and the future is tomorrow and i'm going to create an objective of what i want to get done tomorrow in the very short term that generally works pretty good but it doesn't typically work very well if you start extending the time frame that's why today most most organizational objectives do, uh, executives do not trust their predictions most most organizational leadership is aware that we cannot trust our predictions. Okay, thank you. And that's that's the logic. Um, and I'm not throw, I'm not saying that MBO and, and management by objectives can't be a useful approach, but it also typically brings up all of the constraints. Which is why most strategic planning does, you know, the threats and opportunities and and so forth. You look at the reality now and say, given this reality, what can I do? Rather yeah. than create a new reality. Yes, Randy. Jim, just you know, listening to the, um, the listening to all this is what I, um, you know, I, I'm trying to to package all of this. And um, what's what's interesting about this conversation we're having right right now. Um, and the word reverse engineering comes up to me, but, um, you know, however, I would choose to apply that or not. But having said that, you know, Bill brought up earlier that we had achieved 80% of the goals that we had um, set up, set aside, let's say in 2015, or let's say 2018, I, I can't remember the date. The interesting thing would be to take this, this practice that you are, that you are walking us through right now, and actually look back at those goals and ask ourselves again standing in them today because they are done how did we do it that's not a bad idea that could be useful um because that might share with us um was it luck was it skill was it determination um you know what what drove it what drove us to achieve 80 percent success which is pretty high well um, one, an one answer could be you made small goals so the, I just thought it would be interesting to actually maybe take one or two of those and look at those as a council, um, if we ever choose to do this again, just to kind of to, to figure that out. I, I just I, I'm 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 sensing that there's an exercise here that's beneficial. I think it, you know it's always useful to debrief and learn from the past. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, okay. But but okay. again, the question is if you if you reflect, you, you if you made those goals in 2015 inside a box. And, and only committed to those things that were reasonable and feasible at that time. 
you know, another way of looking at the past is what would we have committed to then if, in fact, we knew what was possible today? I suspect you'd have come up with much bolder goals. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you about predictions? Sure. Uh, I understand what you're saying. You know, you, you cannot um, bind yourself <laughs> to uh, predictions. Uh, but on the other hand, making predictions, having a, uh, a framework, making predictions, and then seeing how they turn out gives you an ability to value, evaluate the mindset you use to making those predictions. Are they the model you use for making those predictions? So are we, are we disagreeing on the uh, usefulness of making predictions and, uh, and evaluating them in terms of uh, no, the validity I'm, I'm not, of the models I'm, I'm not that we're using? I'm not saying that the exercise of making predictions is wrong, and that could be useful. You know, it's, it helps with the critical thinking. It helps ground your judgments. It, it's, it's a useful exercise. The problem is only if you believe your predictions. And if you, if you, listen, if you listen to an, a lot of discussion in, in boardrooms, people are arguing about which prediction is right and which prediction is wrong. And the debating and the argumentation is trying to argue about a future activity that inherently is not predictable. There can be and predictions. It, and it also is not following best practice with regard to SWOT analysis, which well, you really need to do. Well, I get, again, SWOT analysis is perfectly useful, but it's not the only way of looking at planning. And I'm just saying, when you do SWOT analysis, you're laying out a, a, a list of constraints as the starting point for your, your thinking. And I'm, yeah. and I'm suggesting that you will only get commitments that are feasible inside those constraints. Randy? You know, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, and I'm thinking about one of the most important issues that we have uh, facing us. And that's this, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's on the forefront in every, in, in the area um, community and, and regional jurisdiction regarding the uh, social inequities that are um, not being provided in our police servicing contracts. And um, it, it's interesting that this, this to me would be one of a, this using today's discussion to, to state you know, um, what we're looking for or what's probable, am I correct? And then, and then writing what we vision the outcome of the next contract to look like, and then actually doing, going through this process and identifying all the steps that we're gonna need to do to achieve that vision. Yeah, uh, that's that's the idea. And, so, and, and, and go ahead, Randy. No, so, so I'm just, you know, I, I, again, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, how to take the time, and and the expertise that you're providing us. And, well, think think of it this way. Uh, think about think about standing in a future, right? In in which you are a hundred percent satisfied with the quality, the equity, the fairness, uh, the integrity and the uh, execution of the police services that you're contracting for. Right. So, so again, imagine, imagine that you actually have a vision of what that really would look like if in fact it was ideal. Right. Then ask yourself, how did you get there? Now, right. now, now, now here's all I'm saying. For example, in every, in every transaction, in every human instance of coordination, there's a person that's making an offer and there's a person that's receiving the offer. So in this case, this, the, 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 the large other government entity is offering police services or you're requesting police services, either way you want to look at it. Is that right? Okay. And you, there, there has to be something that satisfies you or doesn't satisfy you. That's called conditions of satisfaction. Now, where, where contracts break down, and Matt, you could probably, you know, validate this from a legal point of view, where most contracts break down is that the conditions of satisfaction of the consumer is not the same as the conditions that are promised by the provider. Okay, so I, I think I'm fulfilling one thing and you're not satisfied, and then we end up in a, in a, 
in some kind of a, a, a combative relationship. Now I'm saying, if I remember this correctly, one of the things that we asked was who writes down the conditions of satisfaction for our police services? Do we have it written? What would satisfy us 100% in terms of the quality of the police services? Oh, Jim, that's that's why that's I brought this up. Is you have a contract that's over forty years old. It's well, but more, but but more importantly is Jim. That's what I'm. That's why I'm. That's why I think this is an actual activity that um, that that ha that has uh, validity to what's going on in our community in this moment. Yeah, I um, think it's great. Yeah, that's why I'm looking at this as is trying to figure out how to apply. Um, this new knowledge that we're acquiring today. Um, so it's beneficial for the community. It provides community engagement. It also lets the community understand restraints that might be within this discussion that will allow them to understand the position that we might be in, especially right now, the three people that we've assigned to be accountable for these negotiations, so that they so that the community understands that these three people are acting um, completely on the community on the community's betterment and, and behalf. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm I'm looking at this as a, a as this might be a great process. Um, um, I don't know where I don't know if the short term and the long term of this regarding how much longer we have in the contract negotiations, but. Um, clearly, this is a practice here. What you're giving us today is a great tool that we. Well, it, it, it's all based on the idea that the work is getting done in conversations, nowhere else. Right. You know, whether you call it negotiation or whether you call it planning or whether you call it leadership, it's all conversations. And and where where most of the mischief is is that people aren't clear about the conversations, or the conversations they're having are kind of just automatic extensions and continuation of the way we always do things. So when you then introduce the element of commitment and that our job is creating a future, not overseeing a process, then that says, okay, what are we specifically committed to? Right. Now you've more or less collectively said, we're, we're generally committed or, we, sorry, we generally see, we haven't committed yet, we generally see a vision that consists of all the kinds of things that you spoke a while ago. And now, now I'm saying, okay, so now, it, now we have to start moving toward commitment. If we assume that we're committed to that vision, right. okay, then people are gonna have to take action. And that action is gonna take the form probably, in most cases of making requests or offers or promises that somebody delivers on or they don't. But then oh. you've, the main value of this is that it's observable. Right. Also, what's in, also I believe what's 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 um, valuable is the fact that it's specific to the, to our community or our city only. That's right. Um, and that way, we're not negotiating countywide. We're count. We're negotiating for for us. Yeah. And I see that this is that that's the win in this. Yeah, if 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 you had an RFP, you wouldn't you wouldn't negotiate with your supplier. You'd say the supplier either delivers on the RFP or they don't. Well, right, you write the conditions in the RFP. Exactly. So I'm saying you're not have you don't need to have a negotiation. You need to have clarity around the conditions of satisfaction. Then we're not negotiating it. Right. We we may be looking around for other ways to satisfy the satisfy ourselves. Well, I, I don't want to drag us away, away from you anymore. I just hope you can It's, a, it's a good point because it connects to this issue of goals. All I'm saying is goals typically are specific. They occur in time. There's, there's a human being that's accountable for the realization of that goal. Not the author that doesn't mean they have authority. They just means that they're focused and paying attention. And thirdly, the council or whatever the authority is, is, is the job is how do we hold, how do we handle the exceptions where things aren't working? You now where, where things don't happen the way we committed to them happening. So, so, so the things that are just simply uh, not, not happening, 
we have to deal with. And it may be resources, it may be competency, it may be a lot of a million different reasons why things bog down and start to, to, to not happen. But in this case, we're looking at goals. So, so Bill, you said we didn't accomplish 20% of those goals. Do you have that list right there now? Yeah, I do. Could you look at uh, This was uh, issued a while ago by James. This is dated uh, February 9th, 2021. So, so, so. so state, state one, how many of the, how many of them uh, have we not accomplished numerically? How many? About nine. Okay, so state each one of those and ask your colleagues if they're still committed to that goal. And let me let me show you how I would interact with that. Okay, I'll play along. Uh, city hall analysis, next steps. That was uh, looking at our space needs, what we were gonna do with the fact that our space is so constrained for things like the community development department. Okay, so that's a, re that's a uh, requirements, to de define the requirements of, we need for city hall? Space needs analysis. Space and, needs, okay. Yeah, and, uh, and what we do about it. Okay, so when is that goal, when are you, when in time is that goal committed to be done? Uh, right on this, on this document, it doesn't state any revised return date to council to complete. So, it says so, as part of CIP. James, do you have a date by which that's going to be done? You know, my recommendation, that's actually the one that my recommendation was to take it off the list. I, I don't think it was, a, or I, I don't see the necessity at this point of it. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So that's so. So that goes into the the done the done bucket. Okay. Yeah. So so Around now what's file. I wanted what's, I wanted council to agree to it, but yeah, I was hoping it would. <laughs> okay, but, but then make make sure make sure that that gets agendized so that it can be a formally canceled. Yeah. Or another way of doing it, James, is is say if I don't hear from you, I'll cancel it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, uh, uh, give me another one, Bill. Next one on the list was review and or update the V Ventura County uh, Sheriff's Department contract. So there we go. Okay, now I just want you to hear that both of these uh, are spoken in a way as if they're uh, uh, activities or they're do or they're processy type language. Uh, I'm I'm recommending that you try to tighten goal statements so that you're always looking at an in an outcome. You're looking at a scoreboard. You're not looking at a process. But anyway, in this case, James, where are we on this one? We are actively working on it. The uh, the committee of uh, three that was mentioned earlier. When uh, will it be done? Uh, we've been told we've got a commitment from the sheriff's and the CEO's office that an update will happen this year. When this year? We we did not get specificity. See, I, I mean, I I, I don't want to overly state this because I appreciate a lot of how government and, and public institutions work. But it, I, I could have the same exact conversation in a corporate context. Mm -hmm. This is technically BS. Okay. So one point I'll note there before we go down a particular path, we are working with an independently elected public official from another government with whom we must be respectful. On our end, what we can commit to, what I have committed to, is as directed by council previously, I will be preparing a draft revised sheriff services contract and a draft revised lease for the police station to be reviewed by the council sheriff services negotiations committee, and that will be done by the end of next week. And then, and then yeah. go on to a public. And then from there. That's great. So by the end of next week, you'll have that. Yeah. yeah, and it may be if you're dealing with an independent person, I totally agree with you, Matt. There's no, we don't have any authority or control in that matter. But the same token, we can always request specificity from them. I'm, well, I'm asking, I'm asking you, sir, for a specific by when that will be done, and and with all respect, I need to know that, or I'm asking you for that. Okay. And if I if I can't count on it, then I can't make commitments to coordinate with you in that regard. And I would like to add that that when that is written and given back to our committee, that it is then brought to council before it is submitted. Mm. Of course, public public hearings, public council hearings. comment and public comment. Yeah, right. which are, which none of this is a problem as long as is it's moving in an intentional and directed way. It's only a problem when it drifts into the. We'll get to that this year or, or sometime, or it becomes mm -hmm. part of the vague. Uh, continue, you know, process. Randy? Jim, I had one more question. This is to the mayor and to James. Do we have any public comments or any public speakers? Because we're getting into the last 
25 minutes of our meeting. We, we had opened it up and uh, we have the one public comment that we distributed the the email and then we have the one uh, person who spoke earlier. So we don't we don't have to take any further public comment. The one point I would add is, as I recall, a second person had signed up to provide public comment. And I see that there is a second person in the attendee list okay. on, in the Zoom system. It might be worthwhile seeing if that second person is the person who had signed up to provide public comment and wishes to provide comment. Yeah, it looks like uh, I was just told that that is the person. So we can take that. a you want to take a pause and get that. Yeah, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, I, th I think that'd be a good idea. Great, let's do it. Okay, so Linda, I think you, uh, you if you're there, you have your uh, your three minutes. You're on mute, Linda. Okay. Uh, I would, I guess, let's uh, continue on, and and if we'll we'll leave her in for a minute. If she gets off of you, we'll let her. Okay. Well, let's let let's see if we can knock off the rest of the list that Bill has. So, yeah. so, so, so we, we we're done with we're done interacting with the first two. The third. Uh, this is real a larger issue. How we do um, uh, how we do enforcement of code compliance is listed as continue short term rental enforcement, possibly revisit policy. I believe that uh, James has a, uh, a, pr a proposal for con uh, elevating contract, I mean, com <laughs> excuse me, compliance enforcement coming up, maybe at the next board, uh, council meeting? Yeah, exactly. So uh, this coming Tuesday, we're planning to bring an item back that'll, that'll help our code compliance process. So um, that's the next step on this one. Um, and, 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 and I would say the last major step on this one at this point. So. And what, what, just out of curiosity, what's the, what's the goal for the sake of what we're doing these things? What's the end point? Is there an end point at which we've accomplished it? Because again, this, these, the third one is also an action item or a process or an activity statement. Yeah, I'd say preserve quality of life really is the, you know, is the goal, which is hard because it's, it's an ongoing like struggle. Like it'll never be, you know, there, there isn't a date we say, okay, we're done. You know, it's just ongoing, but it, it's a, uh, the enforcement process is preservation of quality of life. Hey, again, that's a that's a, a, a I understand the words, but it's hard to 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 see that becoming real. Yeah. So do you have a, an assessment in terms of quality of life today? Well, I guess is there, uh, is there a scale or is there, is there some criteria yeah. that. I think I think so we've accomplished. We, so we started with hundreds of, of uh, violations. You know, we're talking, uh, this was specifically the goal was short-term rental enforcement. There were hundreds of short-term rental listings uh, on Airbnb and VRBO. Those are now down to, there's two currently. So uh, it would be great to like, I guess the goal would be to get those two gone, uh, which is what we're working on. And that's part of that process we're bringing back Tuesday. Um, and then uh, I guess the ongoing part is just keeping it at zero. Yeah. So. so the goal would be 100% compliance, and we are, and we, and our, our ability to measure the goal is that we're at 98%. Yeah. That's great. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah, good. And, we're, okay. and we're down. We're down to people that are just treating paying fines as a as a cost of doing business, and we need to address that issue. Yeah. Yeah, but but the the, the main point here is the goal is 100% uh, compliance. Yeah, a measurable well, goal. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one, uh, Bill. Uh, this one actually, it's an old one. It says pending, on hold pending council's direction. That's a, a commitment memorandum of, under, of understanding from Casitas. That's really part of the larger issue of working together on water okay. sustainability. Okay. Yeah. Now, again, are all of these goals are, are they all written as sort of process activities? I would say yes. Yeah, and this is okay. like, well, the the list was created in 2018. Okay, so. well, let's ta let's table that and let's go back to some of the statements that you all came up with in the vision area. Okay. So you could pick any one that you want, but we could take uh, uh, I don't know housing. Uh, you know, uh, is there is there something about affordable housing to which there's a sort of obvious consensus? Yeah, that's one of the things on the list, by the way, the Montgomery uh, Avenue uh, affordable housing project. Mm -hmm. Very that's good. Exactly. One of those things on the list and that we haven't done. Period. Okay, very good. So but when is that going to be done? You need to talk about how to get it done. Well, again, I, I'm inviting you, Bill, to see if you can try to flip the cart 
flip the end point before the how conversation. Okay, I would like to see, uh, I'd say like if an agenda item where we look at some innovative ways of accomplishing that construction uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, outside of the box, so to speak, because everything normally that we've tried in the box has not worked. And, and, and I would add to that innovation that we don't limit ourselves to one story or two story housing, that maybe that's the appropriate spot for a future tiny home park. No, I understand. And I, I love it. I mean, I'm just simply, I'm trying to illuminate the, the, I'll call it habit of thinking, which is we typically think about, we need to know how to do something before we commit to doing it. And I'm proposing- The only way we can talk about it as a group is an agendized meeting because of the Brown Act. So at some point we have to come together, put it on the agenda to discuss how to shift direction I'm and authorize say, it. I'm not saying, I'm just simply saying, and again, this is for your consideration, is that if you say that we are committed to have a design for this property by October or by November, and then we have to convene meetings and whatever else to figure out how and which innovation and so forth and so on, it will be a different process than if we have to figure all that out before we commit to win. And I'm just saying it changes the way we think and the way we observe and mostly the way we participate in conversations. Because if we commit to do it, we may or may not succeed. But we, we now will have to create something in order to meet that date. If we say we got to figure out all the, all the bells and whistles first, and typically that date continues to get pushed out in front of us. When did we make that original goal? Do you know, Bill? Yeah, the date on this document is, uh, believe it or not, uh, June of 2018. Good. So on a scale of on a scale of one to ten, where were we when we made that commitment? Let's say zero. How how far how far along that track have we gone in so, in three years? So Jim, this is what's interesting because you're watching you're you're seeing government at its finest. <laughs> So, so what we do is we create these goals, and then I think at one point we actually prioritize these goals and assigned it to uh, two parties. Assigned it, and then what happens as as we meet biweekly? Guess what? More discussion and more goals are created, which in turn are either put in front of these goals or are not even added. They're just just go do it. So, so again, that's part of. That's part of this innate um, way I, I, of learning is it's by the hip every two weeks. It's real interesting. Look, General Motors has the same problem. <laughs> but what happens is, is it, it, gets, it becomes obvious at some point we're not committed to what we said we were committed to. And, and one of the things that's obviously missing typically is nobody's saying time out. We're not doing what we said. And part of the reason we don't do what we said is because we weren't specific by when we were going to do it. Correct. So, so we can continue to let the, what I call the drift, you know, drift, continue, yeah. continue to determine the future. Right. And if the, if the, if the circumstantial drift is determining the future, then we'll, maybe things will get better, but we're not going to be generating a future as a function of our, of our commitments. The circumstances are going to determine what, what we commit to now. None of this, none of this is uh, uh, guarantees anything other than it brings a certain clarity and rigor to the actions necessary to fulfill a particular outcome. You know, it's perfectly okay to say we're, we're not going to be committed to that anymore, or it's perfectly legitimate to say, you know, let's deprioritize that, or, or or for the staff to say we're overwhelmed, we have more commitments than we can fulfill, and then the council may have to you know, prioritize, you know, or some variation of that. But at least no matter what, we're always generating with intention and commitment and clarity whatever whatever future we're trying to produce. You know, and, and the thing the thing that informs the choices that we're making should be the vision. Once this vision gets languaged. You know, in a way that the council can say, yes, that statement reflects what we created in that meeting in March. That this, this statement encompasses 
at least the essence of what we created when we, we languaged all those possibilities. Once that's in place, that should begin to tell you something about priorities. Which doesn't mean you don't have a lot of tasks and housekeeping and stuff to be, 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 be accountable for, but by the same token, the big, the big, the big, the big, the big goals, you know, if it's that housing goal bill or some something else, we're managing it as a commitment. It's not just a, a project on a list. It's it's human beings making commitments to make things happen. Now, when you go to NASA or some of these agencies in government that have very specific deliverables, very tangible deliverables, this is generally speaking pretty much an inherent part of how they operate. You know, they're not going to say we're going to we're going to launch the we're going to launch that ship once we get our stuff all together. They put a put a put a stake in the ground and say we're going to launch that that uh, that rocket on a particular date, and then they do all the planning they have to do to meet that date. Doesn't mean they always do, but it means that that's the context in which they're making decisions. That's the context in which they're making choices. So anyway, for what it's worth, I, I think that's pretty much the way I would think about it. Now the last we, we we're almost at the end here, so I'm just I'm not I'm not going to push this any further other than to say there's still at least two things that need to to occur at, either in the council or in future a future workshop. One is the languaging and adoption of the vision statement. Two, a more rigorous articulation of what specific goals emphasizing the word specific, what specific goals, outcomes, results need to have been accomplished if we're serious about manifesting this vision. And then it, then you're going to end up with some pretty rich conversation in different scenarios. And then that leads to the final stage, which is, okay, now, who's, are we committed to this as a council? And do we have somebody that's going to carry the ball in terms of keeping this commitment alive and in play? Or letting us know if it's not. Now, yes. Well, Jim, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I keep going back to Susa because she was making a very clear, concise statement about where she saw the city. I think in 2045 or something of that nature. So when we're doing something like this, um, because I, because I think I said earlier, um, short-term visions and long-term visions. So if we made a statement for 20. 30. And then we came back and said, um, by 2025, we will see this. By 2028, we will have achieved this. So we have our benchmarks based on actions that we've taken from today forward. Am I correct in what? Um, yeah, you, you, you're, 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 you're looking at, you're always looking at it from both points of view, today forward and forward backward. Right. You're looking both constantly doing both. The language right. that Sousa said at the beginning is a, an example, and it's perfectly good one, of, an, of a comprehensive vision statement. So the way she spoke that, I could include almost everything you put on this list inside that. But you need you need to agree with you need to have a consent uh, agreement of yourselves that that's the statement you want to go with, because there may be other ways to 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 summarize or create a, a comprehensive statement. Well, I like your thought about, I, I like your idea, Jim, where you say now you stand in it and you look back and how did you achieve it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Be, be, because that tells you how to achieve it. Yeah, exactly. That, become, that becomes the scenario for how we did it. Exactly. Again, it, it, you know, once, once the game starts, the game never goes the way the plan, you know, games are, the difference is, is the difference, Randy, between linear planning you know, if you if you approach landscaping through a tunnel, you know, and you always have to do everything in this order, in this time sequence, and so forth, you, you'd have a great machine for producing predictable and recurring landscapes. But if you're going to bring the artistic element to it, where you actually want to invent new landscape or invent new possibilities or to create more beautiful landscaping, you can't you can't go with your formula. Well. I'm not going to disagree or agree with that because I think there's two parts of what you just said. There is an artistic side, but there's also a process 
that you have to follow to to achieve the end result and no, that, generate that's, money. I, I'm not arguing. Yeah, I agree that, with you. We'll, we'll talk more about that. But anyway, the whole point is I wanted to end this. You've got 10 minutes left of just giving everybody here an opportunity to kind of summarize where you're at now. Say anything you want to say about it. The purpose of this is just to at least complete this call, yeah. including identifying whatever's not complete and, and so forth. So, Susa, you want to go first? Yeah, I would like, uh, after James cleans up that document, if he would send it to us, because I saw a bunch of uh, words that I, I, you know, he's writing quickly, so that we could each correct our statement, not change it, uh, unless it needs something, but, you know, to make sure it was correct. And then um, when we get that done and we absorb what's on that, I, I'm assuming that it's going to be maybe organized into categories or something. <clears throat> and then I would like to meet again to um, articulate the specific goals, net benchmarks. I, I would like that at some point. Okay, good. Somebody, Betsy? Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you. This has been so great. Really appreciate it. Uh, very inspiring. And, and of course, there are 10 more things I want to get on that list. <laughs> uh, and yeah, work with James about with organizing it and then breaking it down and then seeing how we're going to get it into the agenda on the what dates. And then also sharing with the public. I know a lot of people want to watch this and really interested to hear what we all have to say and, and um, getting it out there and then getting people uh, excited and involved. Yeah. Very good. Ryan, thank you for hanging in there, Ryan. Is there anything you'd like to say to just be complete? Well, I mean, look, you know, the Ojai is, you know, Ojai has done this amazing job for a hundred years of uh, being different in a, in a great way. And that's, that makes it, extra hard to be good at all the other parts. And because we have this steadfast fabric of our community that is committed to being what is not the same as the rest of Southern California, especially, um, there's a lot of struggle that we have. You know, we have the longest average commute, the high, the lowest median income, the highest average age. All these fundamental problems in Ojai have got to be managed and dealt with over the next short term couple of years and the long term decade or we're going to lose what is so wonderful this place so i hope that we can not only continue to be what we've been forever but the world around us keeps changing it's hard to stay the same and that's kind of our secret sauce here very good and i really do hope um we can you know i hope that all these ideals we can uh you know organized correctly, but some of those fundamental things about our community, we got to do better. We have to improve so we can keep this place a wonderful place to live and it doesn't get taken over by somebody else. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. Bill? Um, yes, Ryan, I, I, I completely agree. And I've repeated many times, you know, learn the lessons of history as to why OHI is different and apply those to meeting the challenges of the future. There are some very specific actions that have been taken in the past that made us different. And uh, the principles and the thinking behind that is, is useful to contemplate in meeting the challenges of the future. And further in service to that, I think if you look at the history, people found a way to come together at uh, the level necessary for action. They didn't necessarily agree globally on everything. And so uh, we should seek the uh, level of vision we, we, that we can uh, come to, together on in terms of guiding the governance without um, sort of uh, enslaving ourselves to uh, try to work out differences we may have on larger global uh, levels of visioning that uh, uh, the pursuit of which may get in the way of effective governance. Randy? So I think the, um, first of all, Jim, thank you. Um, uh, again, it's, it's um, I'm not going to call myself a real old white man, but it's hard for for, guy, for for men to to challenge themselves to change, so uh, I'm I'm accepting that as something that um, I know that I've that I'm doing in my life, and I believe I'm doing it well. Um, but I can always do better. So having said that, I think the most important thing that we do from a council perspective is 
uh, listen, educate, and communicate. And that's what we did today. Um, we listened to one another um, without um, objecting to the other person's uh, words, opinions, feelings, thoughts, or perception. And I think that that's a big turning point for this council, if we can apply that to each other moving forward. Because I disagree with you doesn't mean I'm your enemy. I generally, if I disagree with you, maybe I disagree of how you're trying to achieve it. Maybe I'm not disagreeing with the goal. So I think if we recognize that and then we carry that out to the community, that we're gonna be a better council for it. And if we can figure out how to take the lessons um, or the information that you've given us today and actually apply it. Um, and that may take some more lessons with you to figure that out. I'm looking forward to that. Good, good. Well, you know, I, uh, I make a, a, a distinction between something being finished and something being complete. Uh, I, you know, we all know people that are divorced that, that are not, they're not complete. They're still reliving and re re experiencing and, and still stuck in, in the old conversation. Uh, and the same true with organizations and meetings. So, so it's like a, a game, you know, a halftime, one of the major jobs of a coach is to help the team be complete with the first half so they can be 100% in the game in the second half. Uh, so I try to, at the end of these meetings, give people a chance to, to do what you've just done, which is to say something to be complete. In my own case, I'm not complete unless I thank you, because I'm very clear that the results of this kind of a meeting happen in your listening, not in whatever I say or even what each other say. It is the generosity with which you listen to each other. It's the way you connect whatever's being said to your commitments and your concerns. And it's the means by which you coordinate your differences that the future gets created. Thank God we don't all agree. You know, what I try to show people, however, is that agreeing doesn't commit. If we agree with each other, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't even mean anything if we disagree, unless we're committed to something. It's only when we commit to something that, that, that things move. The rest is a conversation and a discussion. You know, that the, that the primary difference between conversations that uh, change something and conversations that talk about change is whether people are committed in the conversations. You know, and it's those commitments that ultimately drive action and produce the future that will or won't happen. Uh, but again, I want to say thank you for your listening. Thank you for the opportunity to participate with you. Uh, and I am available to support you in any way I can. It's a privilege, a real privilege to do the work I do. It's a privilege to even be connected to this conversation with you. And uh, it's frankly a privilege to live in Ojai. Uh, I consider living here one of the great miracles of my life. Uh, and uh, I can't think of any place I'd rather be or any place I'd rather die than here. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate sharing and, and committing to each other. Um, so anybody have any announcements before we adjourn? Happy birthday, Randy. <laughs> Hi, Randy. So, so can I uh, say something? Am I, off, am I unmuted? Yeah. Can, uh, um, sure. can we, James, if we have some final thoughts, can we just email them to you? And like Betsy said, she thought of 10 more things. Perhaps, you know, for me to feel complete, I would really like this to be a very, um, readable public document where the where the public understands the council's thinking and visioning and you know i'm willing to i'm a writer i'm willing to help help work on it and maybe we can all chime in a little bit yeah my thought is we bring it i, I was thinking about bringing it back to council you know in a draft form and then and then we can walk through it and and kind of tweak it as you know in a public meeting so yeah. Um, so I, I, I will distribute like the draft version as soon as possible, and then we can schedule that at one of the next two meetings. So. Yeah. And I thought what Ryan said was so important. He really uh, focused in few sentences on what are some of our key issues are. So maybe 
you know, when it comes around, he can put that back in. Sure. If he can quite capture it. Thank Great. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Meeting adjourned. Happy Thanks. Saturday, everybody. Happy Thank you all. Bye bye. <laughs>